This is Cougar Post Game Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Cougar Post Game Live is brought to you by Big O Tires. Stop by your locally owned and operated Big O Tires, the team you trust. Cougar Post Game Live is also brought to you by BYU Creamery, the classic BYU tradition. Have a scoop today. Now, here's the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. BYU 41, Southern Utah 16 is our final. This is Big O Tires Cougar Post Game Live. And let's begin Cougar Post Game Live by chatting with today's Waystar star of the game. A lot of good performances today, but we're going to choose Isaac Rex as today's Waystar star of the game. Brought to you by Waystar, simplifying health care payments. Learn more at waystar.com. Isaac Rex today, four for a buck 12 and a touchdown. A long catch of 65. The 65 yards is a career long. The touchdown ties Gordon Hudson for BYU's all-time touchdown tight end record. 112 is a career high, and he also went over 1,000 yards for his career. Isaac, Greg and hands upstairs. Congratulations to you, brother. Well done. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. So uh, did you feel like it was going to be your day today when you came out? Uh, you know, sometimes it, uh, it just happens like that. So you can never predict it. You just got to go out there, play your game, and have fun. And, uh, yeah, that's what we did today. All right. Did you know that your next touchdown would be the Gordon Hudson touchdown, the 22? Uh, I would lie if I said I didn't. So <laughs> I, um, I've had that as a goal this year uh, to beat the record, and I, I should have done it on that long play. I, I got caught at the five. So Well, let's get to the long throw. Uh, Keaton whistles it in, and yeah, you make great, a great, great throw. Really nice throw, right? Yep, that was all Keaton. That was such a great throw over three defenders. Put it right where I could get it, and I was able to, you know, make some uh, plays after the catch. But, man, Keaton with a great ball right there, and he had a lot of great balls today. Well, Isaac, I'm really happy for you. That was a great performance today. And I, I just want to go to last week's performance as compared to this week. Last week, it felt like there were formation issues, alignment issues, guys out of place. There was one covered-up receiver issue today, but for the most part, it felt like you guys were lined up. Did you feel like it was more fluid sets for you offensively? Oh, definitely. It was a lot more fluid, and we got in a rhythm today, unlike last week. But, we, uh, yeah, we were really disappointed with our play last week as an offense, but we were able to come out today and, you know, uh, play our brand of football, play BYU brand of football. And A-Rod and Fessy and Coach Clark and – Coach Funk, you know, they know how to get us right. And uh, um, I, I can't thank him enough for, you know, coaching us hard and getting us ready this week. Heaton Slovis was winging it today. This felt like the games we've seen over a lot of years of his collegiate career. Do you agree? Oh, of course. Yeah, Keaton's got an arm. You know, there's not a big difference between him and the former quarterbacks that played here. Uh, Zach and Jaron were amazing, but Keaton's right up there with the, as a great quarterback in BYU. All right, you ready for Arkansas next week? Yep, I'm ready, man. Good to have you on, Isaac. Congratulations again to you. Yep, appreciate you guys. Have okay, a good one. that is tight end Isaac Rex, part of our Big O Tires Cougar post game live. Big day for Isaac. Big day for the BYU pass game as the Cougs go for three forty eight through the air, win this one by twenty five forty one to sixteen. More from Provo coming up next on the New Skin BYU Sports Network. You're listening to Cougar Post Game Live. On the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now, back to Greg Rubel. Well, BYU scored 16 in a row, and they score in every quarter. They scored in every quarter today, went at 41-16. to Max Tooley had five tackles, two solo stops, a half tackle for loss, and Max has the headset on down on the field and joins me, Greg Rubel, with Hans Olsen upstairs. Max, congratulations on getting BYU to 2-0. and Hey, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, and, and the last four years, BYU's opened up 2-0, and which had never happened in BYU football history, four straight years of a 2-0 and start. So you're figuring out how to open these years. Maybe you could talk about how you did get to 2-0 and today from your side of the ball. No, yeah. I mean, obviously we want to start every season as strong as we can. And, um, you know, coming in, playing whoever, you know, we know they're going to come in. SUU, they had all the confidence in the world. Um, they played ASU very tight last week, and we knew we were going to get a dogfight, so we just stuck to our game plan. Um, you know, did what we needed to do to, to stay off the field defensively, and uh, offense did what they needed to do, score on offense. And, you know, things worked out. We, we got the, the victory, so can't complain. So, Max, our view up here in the press box tells me that you're much more aggressive on third downs in comparison to the last couple of years that you've played for this university. Would that be a correct assessment? And just how much more aggressive do you feel like this defense is on third down situations? Yeah, I'd say that's a pretty accurate assessment for sure. Um, You know, Coach Hill wants to bring pressure on third downs. He wants to make these quarterbacks um, feel us. 
you know, every time we're on the field. Um, so, you know, getting pressure, getting uh, getting in his face, making him get, ri- get rid of the ball. He was just kind of slinging it a little bit early today. So, you know, that was all part of the plan, getting pressure and forcing incompletions ultimately. So it's a you, big, big part of this. this you, you knew that Southern Utah had scored th- at 21 points uh, at a P5 team last week on the road. Uh, how, what kind of game did they give you today? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, watching that game, we saw how they, they were uh, hungry to win. You know, it didn't matter who they were playing. They wanted to, you know, um, upset upset a Power 5 team, a good Arizona State team, and we expected the exact same thing today. And, um, you know, we just stuck to what we knew, um, fed off of what we did last week, you know, shut out. Not quite as good as a defensive performance today, but, you know, we knew what we had to do to get, what we had to do to get the job done. So, Max, how much fun is it to play next to a guy like Ben Bywater, a sure tackler, an aggressive guy? How much does that help you, and how much fun is that to be next to him? You know, it, in terms of the box score, it's almost uh, a little depressing because I see him get all the tackles, and I'm, I'm just about to be the next guy up there. So, I mean, I love the guy. He's making the plays. He's in the right spot. But, yeah, you know, it's it's good to have each other's energy, bounce off of one each other, um, one another. You know, when one of us is, is making plays, you know, we're just typing each other up. So, And you were in the kind of game today where some of the depth linebackers could get into the game and, and show themselves. How would you grade uh, the way the reserves came in and, and, and got to work? Oh, yeah. No, they were solid. You know, Sione came in, Sione Moa. You know, I don't think anybody has really heard his name much, but, I mean, he's a force to be reckoned with. He, he came in and he played strong, had some tackles. Um, Harry Taggart, you know, he was playing hard all, all game on special teams. Um, but, yeah, no, Chaz as well. You know, we had, we had those guys. We had all confidence in them, and they came in. And, you know, to handle business. So. Max, Max, thanks for your time. Appreciate you, buddy. Thanks, Max. Okay, that's Max Tooley. We'll come back with more Big O Tires Cougar Post Game Live after this on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Let's rejoin Greg Rubel and Hans Olsen for more Cougar Post Game Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. BYU 41, Southern Utah 16 is our final score. Joining us on Big O Tires Cougar Post Game Live, Cougar quarterback Keaton Slovis. Keaton today 22 for 32 for 348, four passing touchdowns, another rushing score. Keaton, congratulations to you and the Cougs on getting to 2-0 today. Thank you, appreciate it. You guys really got rolling late first quarter and then all of second quarter. It felt like, okay, this is where this thing needs to be. How did you feel about that stage of the game when things began to really get cooking for you? Yeah, I felt really good, and honestly, that's that's the offense that we've been seeing, you know, from our perspective all fall camp. Uh, I've had a lot of confidence in the group. I felt really good going into game one. Game one, we didn't play our, our best, and we really just uncharacteristic game for us. This is who we are. I'm um, pretty proud of the guys, the way we act. It wasn't perfect, um, and a lot of plays down the stretch that, you know, we like to have back, but uh, the good thing is we, we uh, you know, we, 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 we stood, stood tough and tall through adversity, and, uh, you know, a lot of the scores uh, ended in touchdowns. A lot of drives and touchdowns. Yeah, BYU scored 21 in the second quarter. Kalani's never lost a game at BYU. 22-0. and and BYU can score at least 21 and a quarter, so that's a nice recipe for success. Uh, that said, Keaton, what was different for you this week than last week, personally? Um, I think the guys just felt more confident in the game plan. I think having Kibo back helps a lot, especially with the new receivers. You know, uh, kind of takes them off their plate and lets them dial into the plays that they're going to be run. Um, and also, I think everyone just kind of let loose. I think in the first game, we have such high expectations for ourselves. I think looking back, you know, we, again, we did so many uncharacteristic things. Looking at this game, you know, I think guys just settled in, played ball, myself included. I made too many mistakes in the first half. Um, you know, I think guys, again, it's not perfect, but we're pretty happy with how we played this game. So what, you've just been watching Steve Young footage? You've decided that you're a rushing quarterback? What's going on with all the rushing touchdowns, Keaton? I mean, they're not too difficult. I got credit Rod. You know, he's down up for me, and we got some great running backs. And down the red zone, it's tough for them to kind of key both. Honestly, I thought down there uh, it, was, it was pretty much the same play as last week. Um, I thought they'd, you know, key in on, the, on me running and, you know, again, kind of give me force, force my hand. I had to pull it. So many positives in this game. I do want to go down to one situation, the covered receiver. What's happened in those two scenarios where there's a covered receiver, and how do you fix that? Yeah, again, it's just, just preparation really being dialed in. You know, that's, that hurts. You know, everyone's like, oh, what happened in the first two drives? We were moving. That's a two, two, would have been two third down, third long conversions in the first drive. Um, and it just kills us, you know. And, um, you know, it's, I got to be better in getting those guys lined up. But, uh, you know, as a whole, we'll get cleaned up. And, again, I thought it was a lot clearer last week, but we still have a lot, long ways to go. 
We've been talking a lot about a lot of historical numbers. You hit 10,000 yards last week. By the way, your past touchdown numbers up to 72 now for your career. So you go 10,000 yards last week, and then Isaac Rex gets the history numbers today. He goes over 1,000 yards for his career, and the touchdown pass you got to him tied him with Gordon Hudson for the all-time BYU tie down touchdown catch record. Did you know that was coming for him? I did. Uh, I kind of kind of gave him a hard time at halftime. You know, that, that if he just got in that second time, it would have been the record. <laughs> and it would have been, I told him, I said, Byron Rex would have made sure that the Rexes had that play on repeat <laughs> in the household somewhere. Uh, but, yeah, we'll get him that, that record at some point. But he had a heck of a game. He's a great player, and I'm just happy to see him healthy and, and, and you know, playing himself to his kid. kid. Uh, to his potential. Did you feel like your protection picked up a little bit up in front of you uh, on the passing uh, uh, downs? Did you feel like maybe the the offensive line picked it up a bit? Yeah, you know, I feel great about that unit. I think it's one of the better units I've been around, if not the best. And uh, even when we do get pressure, it's a nice place to step up into that one to chase. A little in pressure, but allowed me to step up, and uh, there's a lot of space, and it makes my job really easy. Kind of clears the picture. Keaton, thanks again for the time. Congrats. Yes, sir. Appreciate you guys. All right, that's Keaton Slovis, BYU starting quarterback, and this is Big O Tires Cougar Post Game Live. We'll come back with Hans Olsen's Steel Man of the Game. Yes, the Steel Man of the Game award is coming up in a moment. BYU wins today's final score, 41 to 16. Metal Mart Steel Man of the Game next here on the New Skin BYU Sports Network. With more post-game reaction, here's Hans Olsen and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel, with more Cougar post-game live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Okay, Hans Olsen, uh, you, you mentioned you talked about protection a moment ago with Keaton. How about this number? Under Kalani Sitake, BYU's now 20-3 and three when the Cougs don't allow a sack, and they did not allow a sack again today. That's two straight games, no sacks allowed. 20-3 and three without a sack. Yeah. Man, that's an impressive number. Um, obviously, this was a really well-protected game. But, Greg, it can always be a little bit better. And we did see a couple of pressures that came in pretty critical moments. Uh, I wonder just how injured Kingsley Solmata is. Because he, he was a little bit slow on a set on the outside that gave up a little bit of pressure. And then he was in and out with Kaim, and then he went into the medical tent. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that Kingsley is okay and is going to be primed and ready for Arkansas because yeah. that's a guy you cannot miss up front. Let's get to the uh, scoring recap, and then we'll get your Palmer's Medal March steel man of the game. BYU's first two drives today did not result in points, a punt and a pick on drives one and two, but then it was three straight touchdown drives. The first one ended this way after a nine-play, 85-yard possession in the late first quarter. They'll motion Fakahua from right to left. Stop him at tackle left. Keaton Slovis, a throwback. Rex makes the catch, makes the dive, has the score. Touchdown, Cougars! Rise and shout! The Cougars make it 6-3 to three with 103 to go in quarter number one. That was the final drive of the first quarter. First drive of the second quarter. Five plays, 36 yards, short field, and a score. The hand clap, the helmet high snap, the play fake. Keaton Slovis sets and fires and has Keanu Hill in the end zone for the touchdown. Rise and shout. The Cougars score six more and take the 12-3 lead with 12.36 to go in quarter number two. And a third straight drive resulting in a third straight score. This one took four minutes and 22 seconds, went 78 yards, eight plays, the final of which was this. High snap, Keaton a half bobble. A back screen, a back catch by Lassiter. Lassiter down the far boundary. Stays in bounds. 15, 10, 5, touchdown! Rise and shout! Darius Lassiter with his first touchdown as a Cougar. And what a play to stay in bounds, keep his feet. The Cougs go up 19 to 3 with the PAT pending. And the Cougs' final possession of the first half came after a Camden Garrett pick. Put the Cougs in two-minute mode. They only needed 37 seconds of the two minutes to go three plays, 70 yards, and finish the drive this way. A fly sweep give to Deion Smith. To the boundary, to the pylon, to the end zone! Touchdown! Rise and shout! And the first career touchdown for Deion Smith as a BYU Cougar. The Colorado transfer gets in for six, and the Cougars make it six more. Finally, the halftime score was 27-3. to BYU would score two more times in the second half. And their final two touchdowns went this way. With the score 27-10, Keaton Slovis got his third rushing touchdown in two weeks. 
keeps it, pulls it away from LJ, and saunters in for six. Rise and shout! Keenan Slovis scores on the ground, and the Cougars make it 33 to 10 with the PAT pending. And we'll say it again: a guy with zero career rushing touchdowns coming into last week has scored again on the ground. He's got three. In two weeks, Keaton Slovis capping a seven-play, 72-yard drive. It was 34-10 Cougs, and they would cap their scoring with a beautiful play as uh, stepping up in the pocket was Keaton Slovis to find Chase Roberts. It came in the fourth quarter, and it sounded this way. He's left flat as Slovis steps up, throws on the run. He's got a man at the goal line. He's got a touchdown to Chase Roberts. Roberts got free. Slovis finds him, and it's rise and shout for six more. The Cougars make it 40-10 to with the PAT pending. 41-10 41-10 on the PAT. The uh, T-Birds tack on a score without a PAT. 41-16 is your final, bringing us to tonight's Palmer's Metal Mart Steel Man of the Game. Palmer's Metal Mart is the source for metal roofing and siding. When you buy from Palmer's Metal Mart, you buy from the manufacturer direct and you save money. Hans Olsen, who do you like as today's and tonight's Steel Man of the Game? Well, I'm going to combine a couple of games for this guy because he's just been steady and solid. I talked about it during the broadcast. If he gets his hands on you, you're coming down. Ben Bywater, seven tackles. He had a nice TFL. He's been in the backfield a few times. He had two quarterback hurries. He was all over the quarterback. They use him in blitz. They use him in so many different formations. He has to be loving Jay Hill's defense. So Ben Bywater is the steel man. Yes, and he's got to be loving what Jay Hill has brought to the the defensive side of the ball. We're going to have to find some kind of award for Marcus McKenzie because he keeps doing things himself that may not fit into any particular category, but when it comes to key plays on special teams, you look to number 32. And it was really nice to see him get those defensive second string reps. When you got nine minutes left in the fourth quarter and a nice lead, they throw Marcus McKenzie out there. That's showing a lot of confidence because – what do you think? A guy's going to try to hoist the football. So you need to have corners out there that can run. And that's what Marcus does. So you're right, Marcus, we've, we've definitely got our eye on him. But he has become a special teams phenom. Some numbers of note today as BYU wins at 41-16. to They outgain the T-Birds 394-346. to Through the air, it was 348-262. to Neither team got to 100 yards on the ground. BYU ran for 46 and Southern Utah for 84. BYU cut the penalty number down. They had 8 for 66 last week, 3 for 25 today. First downs, BYU improved there, had 18 to Southern Utah's 16. BYU not a great third down number today, and Southern Utah's got better as the game went along. BYU only 30% on 3 for 10. That's a number to improve upon, and Southern Utah went 50%, 8 for 16 after going 2 for 7. So they went 6 for 9 on third downs in the second half. BYU did, however, convert on both of its fourth down tries, going two for two. BYU snapped 55 plays after snapping 67 last week, and so 55 is a little shy of where A-Rod wants to be. Southern Utah got off 60 plays. BYU's yards per play number went from 3.8 in game one to 7.2 in game two, and the yards per completion, yards per attempt numbers were both up for the Cougs as well. BYU, through two weeks, is now... Six for six in the red zone, and all six scores are touchdowns. That is an important number. It's Sam Houston. It's SUU. That said, they've done exactly what they want to do when they get into a scoring position, not just score points, but score touchdowns. Six for six, all six scores are TDs. Let's call that an important development. 28-41 in possession time to Southern Utah's 31-19, so they were outpossessed by a bit. The turnover battle, BYU wins it again. BYU plus one today, taking it away twice and giving it away once. Neither team had a sack. Southern Utah had five TFLs to BYU's four. Some individual defensive numbers of note. Ben Bywater, who was hands as steel man of the game, led BYU in tackles with seven, had two solo stops, had a half tackle for loss, and had one quarterback hurry on his resume today. Ethan Slade was the number two tackler. In fact, tied Bywater for number one with seven tackles, and four of them were solo. Max Tooley, Five tackles, two solo, half tackle for loss. Eddie Heckard, four stops, two solo. And Blake Mangelson, the mangler, with four stops and two solo. And those were the two guys with four tackles or more. Caden Hawes, credited with the TFL. Caleb Christensen, a TFL. Camden Garrett, a pass breakup and a pick. And Jacob Robinson, another pass breakup for him. Some defensive numbers of note. What else jumped out to you overall, hands defensively? Well, you mentioned Mangelson's numbers, and he's now put together two games of really solid performance. He's a hustler. He's a tough guy. 
I was talking to one of BYU's defensive coaches, and he said he's an old throwback. He just is nasty, and he gets after it, and I love that. I also wanted to bring up Taggart because I thought Taggart made a couple of big plays down the stretch as well. So I like the backup linebacker for BYU. I think that Harrison Taggart is showing a lot, and he is earning and deserving more and more play time and showing that he can play some big-time football. In what quarter did the uh, the punt block happen? Do you remember top of your head? Was that was that a second quarter possession? I think it was so, the it, 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 it was, was second. second quarter. It was first possession, of second quarter. Let's give uh, let's make sure we get the punt block credited to Harrison Taggart. Yeah. Uh, Taggart was was the punt block, uh, and that was a, a key moment in the game. And uh, yeah, part of today's defensive profile for the Cougs for sure. We'll take a break. It is Big O Tires Cougar Post Game Live. It is brought to you by JCWs. If tailgating's not your thing, but you still want to eat good after the game. JCW's has mouth-watering burgers and shakes the whole family can enjoy. JCW's quality and a lot of it. More of Big O Tires Cougar Post Game Live is coming up. BYU defeats Southern Utah by a final score of 41 to 16 on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. You're listening to Cougar Post Game Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now, back to Greg Rubel. All right, for a fourth straight season, BYU wins its first two games of the season. Now comes the 10-game P5 grind. Ten consecutive weeks of power conference opponents. BYU's never played as many as 10 in a season, of course. Now that they're in the Big 12, that's going to happen. And uh, Arkansas kicks things off next week in Fayetteville, then Kansas, and then back home for Cincinnati. That will get you through September. And then the uh, teeth of the Big 12 schedule will be upon BYU. Greg Rubel and Hans Olsen here in our Feast Box broadcast booth. We'll soon be chatting with Marcus McKenzie down on the field. We'll hear, too, from Delane Fitzgerald, Southern Utah's head coach. Hans, uh, we expected offensive improvements from 14 points in Game 1 to an FCS foe in Game 2. But more specifically, where do you think you saw what you wanted to see tonight? Well, just the lineup. We talked to Isaac Rex here in the post game, and I asked Isaac, did you feel like there was some improvement? He said, absolutely. And that goes to Coach Clark, and it goes to Coach Roderick, and it goes to Coach Sataki, uh, speaking of Fessy. And they did. They improved it. You didn't see as many miscues. We did see the covered-up receiver. I don't want to see it again. It's That's really frustrating because that did bring back a big third-down pass that would have built the momentum. But I really liked what I saw. We've liked what we've seen from Marcus McKenzie for two consecutive weeks now as Marcus puts on the headphones down at field level with our Mitchell Jurgens And hands back in the day, you were a teammate yeah. with his dad, Brian. Yes. And, and now we've seen, uh, we've seen uh, one of the twin sons, Marcus, just launch onto the BYU scene on special teams and doing other great things. And Marcus, first of all, Greg Grubel and Hans Olsen upstairs. Thanks for putting on the headset and coming on for a minute. Congratulations to you and the boys. For sure. Thank you, guys. I want to know, do you get this speed from your mom or your dad? Uh, <laughs> they probably argue about it, but I say they get, I get it from both. Okay. okay. I, I love it because people know that your dad was a great running back here, but your mom also a track star here. Yeah. Both fantastic athletes. I want you to talk a little bit about the intensity that you bring to the field on the special team side of the ball. What are you thinking when that ball leaves the foot of the punter? Man, I'm just grateful for the opportunity. When uh, when Rico kicks it in the air for 20 seconds, you know, I get the opportunity to go down there and make a play. You know, my job's easy. Sprint down and tackle the dude. So I, I'm just grateful for that. It's, it's fun. Yeah, there was one today. I think the distance was only 46 yards, but you've also covered a 64-yarder today. But the 46 went about a mile and a half high. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we have such good players on our team and it's a whole team effort it's awesome okay. so so marcus take me into that moment where you get to come out on the field now at the corner position you're going from a special team superstar to coming out and pressing on a corner a lot of anxiety build up there take me into that moment where you're on the field as the corner no it, it's fun i'm just really focused on uh wanting to do the right job you know not mess up but uh it's it's about the same as special teams you get the opportunity to go out and play and i'm just grateful for the coaches for giving me that opportunity how much do you appreciate the fact that you've already been able to establish kind of an identity to where now people, not just broadcasters, but fans and certainly opponents are trying to find number 32 out there on, on, on punts? Man, I'm just grateful. I mean, we have so many people on our team that can come out and, and ball out, and that's just what's so awesome about BYU. We're, we're so deep with talent, and uh, I was just grateful for the coaches trusting me. 
How, how pleased are you with the way the team overall performed after winning 14 nothing to winning a week later 41-16? to I think it's awesome. You know, it just shows what we do. We go back to the field room, do the small things right, and we, you know, we still got things to learn from this week, but we're going to go out and, and show Arkansas what's up. Marcus, catch us up on your twin brother. Where is he at, and is he going to be – is he going to be racing you to the punt cover guy? Oh yeah, that w- that would be fun. I didn't even think of that. Uh, but yeah, he'll be he'll be back from his mission soon, and it will be it'll be fun to have him here. Marcus, it's been a pleasure chatting with you today. We'll do it again, I'm sure. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks a lot. Congratulations, Marcus McKenzie, special team standout, joining us. I think Mitch has the headset ready to pop on to. Is it Cam Garrett down there? I think it's Cam, right? Right, Camden Garrett is uh, throwing on the headset, and Camden Garrett will be our final player interview from field level. And Cam made a big play, Hans. When that play came late in the first half, huge one to give BYU the ball back, and a nice play made by Cam. You loved it. It was a textbook, what you want to see from your corner. I loved it, Camden. Nice press, really nice pressure. Take us into that play. Uh, uh, It was a man-to-man call. Um, He ran a double move. We've been studying all week. I just found the ball and went to go get it. Pretty simple hands when he puts it that way, I guess. Yeah, it makes it pretty easy. So talk about some of the aggression that you bring to this team because you bring that Jay Hill, Weber State nasty aggression with you. Is that just full intent to get this defense to get up to that aggression? I mean, yeah, that, that's how Coach Hill coaches us. So he wants us to be aggressive, play with our heads on fire, uh, make sure we're, we're, we're making the right reads and playing fast. So after a, a, a shutout last week, Coach Hill still wanted to see some more from you guys. When you guys met as defenders and, and, and as a unit and then as a team, what, what did you hope the defense came out today with and how much do you think you got done in that respect? We just wanted to keep the pressure on. I, uh, there, there's some things that we need to clean up coming out the game faster, uh, coming out of half faster, so I'll be sure we get that cleaned up. Well, Camden, take us a little bit further into what needs to be cleaned up because we did see a couple of third down completions that made us a little bit nervous across the middle of the field. What kinds of things can you clean up on the outside, especially in the defensive backfield? Um, we just need to make sure we're, we're honed in on what we need to do. Um, our assignment, we got to make sure we're playing fast and we uh keying the right things. So now that you've played Sam Houston and Southern Utah and given yourselves a 2-0 and record, what kind of foundation have you laid, do you think, for the season right now, Camden? Uh, we just got to keep, keep going, keep the pressure on, keep our foot on the gas pedal, and, and, and keep, keep playing hard how we play and everything uh, uh, take care of itself. How excited are you to get into SEC country next week? It's going to be fun. I can't wait. What do you think about playing in this big Cougar stadium? Have you enjoyed Lavelle Edwards Stadium? Oh, my God. I, <laughs> I kind of don't have words for it. They're electric. I, I, I love it. I love it. Uh, the weather got a little squirrely today. Uh, one time I thought it was a penalty flag. Now it was just a cheeseburger wrapper flying around out there. It was pretty wild. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it got windy there. How much does that affect the game? Um, we, we, we can't. We, we can control what we control. So if it's windy, rain, snow, it doesn't matter to us. We, we just want to play ball. I, I know you want to keep this thing going as long as you can, but 2-0 uh, and is 2-0, and o, and we've already talked about it on the broadcast. In, in BYU's history, they, they, they've been 2-0 and o in four straight seasons. Well, this is the first time it's ever happened that BYU's been 2-0 and o in four straight seasons. So a solid start is, is part of the way on to a solid season. And I know you feel good to get the results in your first two games. So nice to be at home for back-to-back games too, isn't it, Camden? Yeah, it is, it, especially playing in the stadium with all these fans. Man, they were great today. Whether it's a nighttime or a daytime, you feel it, don't you? Yeah, for sure. Cam, to take us into the, the press to man to zone, uh, with Jay Hill's defense, how much press are you running in these first two games as compared to the zone that you're setting into? Um, we, he, he calls a lot of man calls. He trusts us. He trusts us uh, on the outside and in the inside as well. So um, we just play to play and everything will uh, work out. Camden, really appreciate you being with us today for the first time, uh, joining us and being part of a win that uh, sends the Kooks to 2-0. and Well done. Got a boy, Camden. Oh, by the way, before you go, quickly, quickly, uh, your first career pick at BYU, that feel pretty good to do it in a BYU uniform? Man, it felt great. It felt, <laughs> it felt great. Me and Ed and Coach Ed were joking about it, man. It's, it's, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Well, Eddie got his last week, and you got your first this week. So, congrats again. Hey, don't hey, don't let it be a once in a lifetime opportunity, man. Make it a ten or fifteen opportunity. Of course, yeah, of keep course, it up. Yeah, yeah thank you, thank, thank you, thanks, Camden. Me. That's Camden Garrett. Appreciate it. All right, uh, we'll take a break. We come back. We'll hear from Southern Utah's head coach as Big O Tires Cougar Post Game Live continues on the New Skin BYU Sports Network. With more post-game reaction, here's Hans Olsen and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel, with more Cougar post-game live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. 
right, the BYU head coach Kalani Sitake is standing by. We're going to get right to the Cougar postgame coaches show in a moment. Kalani with the win today goes to 58-34 and 34 after 92 games as BYU's head coach. And before we take a break, that brings us into Kalani. Hands quickly, uh, the number I mentioned a moment ago, the red zone, the 6-for-6 six six with 6 TDs, significant? Very significant, and that's something that Aaron Roderick has looked at for a lot of years. Let me just tell you, Aaron Roderick, he's a fantastic offensive coordinator. Why? Because he's come with a lot of experience. What happened in some of that experience? Not that level of off or, or red zone play. So in that time and his experience, he's decided, I'm going to put a lot of time and attention. When I get into that scoring zone, I want to make an effort for the end zone. And it's paid off. It, but Greg, that comes with a lot, a lot, a lot of experience being in the red zone. And he's calling some real efficient offense when he gets close to the the goal line. Well, BYU last year, uh, it was ID'd as an area uh, of uh, by A-Rod to, you know, uh, let's have that be an area we can get better at. BYU yeah. was 83rd nationally in touchdown percentage last year, and so far it's 6-for-6 six six, scoring on every time. They've gotten inside the 20 and scoring with 6. We'll come back with Kalani Sitake next on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. <laughs> Postgame coverage of BYU football continues with the BYU Creamery Cougar Postgame Coaches Show. BYU Creamery, the classic BYU tradition. Have a scoop today. The Postgame Coaches Show is also brought to you by Economics Partners, a national leader in business valuation services. Learn more at econpartners.com. Let's rejoin the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Coming to you live from LaBelle Edwards Stadium, 41-16, BYU over Southern Utah. Fans, remember, when the Cougars win, you win with Papa John's Pizza. Use the online promo code BYU50 on the app or at papajohns.com Monday and receive 50% off pizza. This offer is good at any Utah location Monday only. Congratulations to BYU head coach Kalani Sitake on going to 2-0 and with his team and getting career win number 58 for his BYU tenure. Kalani, thanks for coming on, and again, congrats to you and the boys. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Glad, glad we got the win, and um, you know, got some young guys on the field and uh, valuable reps for the, for their development. So I'm, I'm excited to build off of this and get get to week three. So a lot, a lot of fun, but obviously um, some errors and th- some things to fix. But I, I'm really, really happy with the effort, and the energy from the boys. Of the main things you either wanted to see or get done today, how much of it got accomplished? Yeah, a good, good, good amount of it. I mean, there's there's still the frustration I have on the run game, but. Uh, other than that, it's it's like I I think if a team's going to take up, you know, try to take away the run, we got to be able to throw the ball. And, and I was really happy that we were able to throw for some yardage and get some touchdowns. And uh, you know, we, we were going to need to do um, all that. I mean, I but I'd like to see more um, more presence in the run game. That that's I think Hans, you you see it too. Oh, right? yeah. It's just like we're we're we get we're way better than this, and, and we got to be better. But um, and that's that's from all of us. There's not one reason other than there's a bunch of them so we got to do a bunch of it right yeah but i do see what you're talking about coach and and i I see the different spill techniques that they're running and they're putting linebackers in gaps and they're putting six and sometimes seven in the box and then spilling with an outside back it feels like the last two teams have really keyed on the run how much leeway do you give your offense when you take a look at the film and the defense is really showing the run stop potential or the run stop effort how much leeway do you give your guys yeah i i think for for us it's the it's like we we got to get a rhythm of it there's 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 a and and granted you want to give credit to the defense for disrupting the rhythm but we're not getting into a rhythm in the run game it's like there's 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 a there's a disconnect and so we've got to find that connection these are things that that we can accomplish and, and we've seen it before we even we even seen it in practice and but now for some reason and you've seen flashes of it in the games but we've got to got to see it consistently that's going to be the key for us getting it done for this next game Kingsley was in and out at uh, left tackle today uh any concerns there no he, he actually came back that you know looking at it and we had to run some x-rays and run some tests and and it, it all looked good. So obviously he's in pain, but he's going to have to uh, get some treatment and find a way to to, to get, make it feel better. But he's going to be fine. He's a tough kid. Came back and played, and we're just uh, we'll, we'll we'll count on him being back for us next week. Coach, I'd say one of the biggest, most obvious differences from my point of view, all the way up in this booth, was the receivers blocking 
My goodness. Uh, you know, you throw the pass to the outside, and whether it was Isaac Rex or it was Lassiter, Lassiter sat a defender on your side of the bench. It was a lot better blocking from the receivers. How much did you guys focus on that through the week of preparation, and how did you feel about the receiver blocking in this game? Well, I know Fessy was not happy with it last week, and, um, you know, he, he challenged the players, and, and, you know, it was good to have Kibo back because he's a guy that – He's a big kid that, that has tons of experience, and, and he he leads by example. And so it was nice that he was out there doing the same thing. But, yeah, you saw this uh, a new – that's how we play. We, our, our receivers have to block, and it's the stuff that, that nobody talks about except for you guys because you guys are smart and you see it. But that springs the big plays. I mean, that, that allows Isaac Rex to get to the five-yard line instead of getting tackled at the 30. You know, So it's all the little things like that that can – really help our team we just need to make sure we 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 you know that we, we we follow up on it and that we continue to do it consistently that's going to be the key for us and involving Isaac Rex the way BYU did today is a big part of this offense looking like the offense you think you've got yeah and you know he's a he's a huge weapon for us and and I'm glad that we're able to use him that, that's that's the whole point of um, getting him back here and he's healthy now so uh, man it was nice to see him get out there and make big plays and to, to get some targets on him. I'm telling you, this, if we can just keep our quarterback standing up and letting him deliver the ball, he's really good. So we have to find a way to get him, uh, to keep him from getting hit, and he, he'll, he, will, he will get the ball downfield. He'll, he will find a way. The play that he got hit and it was a, it was an interception, I'm telling you, that probably was good, would have been a touchdown. So he's mm-hmm. got the vision for it. Uh, I think he's getting the ball out at the right time. It's just us. we got to. We have to make the blocks. We have to make take the right angles and get the right technique down so that we can give him that extra second. What was the over-under in the coach's room for Keaton Slovis rushing touchdowns before this season started, Kalani? Because I can't. Three, three rushing touchdowns. And that rush he had off the left side, he broke a hand tackle and found the end zone. Would you have thought that he'd be this active in the running part of the game? Well, you know, he, he actually worked really hard in the off season to get in this great shape that he is and, and we worked really well with the strength conditioning and our sports scientists to get him in the in the best spot. He's got he's got more speed and athleticism than people think, you know, but especially compared to the other years. And so uh he's making the right reads. We don't want him to have to run the ball all the time, but he's he's got this confidence of being able to run it because he has confidence what he's done in the weight room how he's done in his training, how he feels physically, and then the scheme is allowing him to, to, to do the right things. And when he pulls it, uh, it, it doesn't hurt that when he pulls it, he's got two touchdowns now, you know. But uh, but he's he's most effective throwing the ball. That's where he's really, really good and, and leading the ball and handing the ball off. So as long as we can allow him to be a general and, and, and do utilize his strengths, if we need him to run, he'll be just fine doing it. Even with that pick that came on being hit, he was a 195.1 in pass efficiency, ra- pass efficiency rating today, 348 for the day. He threw four touchdown passes to four different receivers, and that's without Cody Epps even playing for you. Yeah, good to see Kibo Keanu. He'll get back in and get in the end zone too. Yeah, and, and we have, um, I mean, those guys have done an amazing job prepping for this and, and um, being in the right spots. Uh, there's obviously some plays that, that I know the guys wish they had back, but uh, this is stuff we can build on. I, I, I'm really proud of the guys and how they stuck with things. It didn't look great at the beginning, you know, but we know that it's going to be hard to keep our team um, off, you know, just just not doing things right for an entire game. So uh, we'll get things done eventually. And I just like to see us playing 60 full minutes of just effective football in all three phases. If we can do that, I think we're, we stand a really good chance. But, um just just the, the little things that we can control. I, I know that some teams are going to be better and make better, more plays, but we, we've got to stop shooting ourselves in the foot. Interesting game coming up next week, Kalani, against Arkansas. Obviously a team with an athletic quarterback and a great running back in A.J. Green. They've got a couple of options in that backfield. When you look at that game and you just take a look at your defense, the way they've been setting edges because K.J. Jefferson loves to get off the edge, you feeling pretty confident that your defense can hold up to that task with KJ Jefferson and that Arkansas Razorback team? Well, he's a special player, and and I mean he he finds ways. He's big and strong, first of all, and he can throw the ball, and then he has tons of experience. So he's very confident in his abilities. 
we're going to have to find ways, and, and I trust Jay and all this to, to throw him off a little bit. But uh, defensively, I think we'll be fine. Scheme-wise, uh, we've got we got to utilize the right the right personnel and make sure that we put our guys in the best position to have success and make bigger plays. I, I know that we've not had a, a bunch of uh, disruption in terms of sacks and production that way, but we're getting some picks. There's so, there's I'm, there's so many plays that we left on defense, and hence you can see it where it's like, man, we're maybe a step away or, or we're one guy away, whether it's a blitz or a pass rush or a, a, a play on a route. And um, those plays will come, you know, as long as we keep working on the, these guys improving their technique. Half a step will get you, uh, you know, a pick six, and uh, we can get this done. I think the film is going to show it for our boys, and they trust our coaches. I think it's going to be a really good thing for us. By the way, Arkansas today uh, defeated Kent State. Final score was 28-6. to They scored seven points in each quarter for their 28. K.J. Jefferson, 13 for 19 for a buck 36 and two scores, no picks. He ran it 13 times for 48 yards. Hans mentions A.J. Green. We didn't see Raheem Sanders. Um, Sanders mm-hmm. standout, and he has a knee issue that uh, Coach Pittman said will keep him out for a game or two. Did not Good play today. Out. We'll see if he's uh, good to go next week. Well, they, they have players all over the place. So, uh, you know, I think they have some depth. For us, it, it doesn't matter who shows up. We need to be assignment sound, and we have to be really, really nice with our technique. If we can do all that, I, I, I think we're going to be in a good spot. But but uh, we'll, we'll definitely be able to utilize the time and, and build off of the foundation that we've set with this defense. Yep. I think they tackle well. We we've, we obviously miss a few things, but I really like the way you know the the, the safeties are tackling, the, the the corners are tackling, and uh, overall as a team, I just like the intensity that that Jay brings to the to the group, and and um, they're playing with a lot of confidence. We just it, I didn't not like the, that we gave up some scores, but it was um, you know we got some reserve players in there. They they gave a score, but they were able to bounce back and, and force a, uh, a punt, which is that's vital to us. It doesn't look good in the stats, but we need that development for these guys. And and those plays that they got in the fourth quarter are going to be huge for our, for our our future. We'll take a break. We'll come back and conclude comments with Kalani Ryan Rico. By the way, speaking of punting, five punts for a 45 yard average today, a long of 62. And some great hang time again and some great special teams work from Marcus McKenzie. We'll talk with Kalani about Marcus and other things after this. 41-16 the final. BYU over SUU. This is the Cougar Post Game Coaches Show brought to you by the BYU Creamery on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. You're listening to the Cougar Post Game Coaches Show on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now, back to Hans Olsen and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Creamery Cougar postgame coaches show continues here from Lavelle Edwards Stadium. We're in front of 60,000 plus. BYU defeats Southern Utah. The final score today is 41 to 16. BYU 2 and 0. Fourth straight season. Kalani, you've been 2 and 0. My listeners have already heard me talk about it, and will remind you that in BYU's great football history, they've never had a four games, a four season stretch where they have 2 and 0 starts in all four of those years. So a little bit of history made. Nice to be uh, where you are. Let's go, man. I, I, I'm trying to get 3 and 0 now. So. <laughs> The uh, yeah, I, I'm really happy with our team and um and, and and the potential here that we have, and I'm I'm looking forward to keep building on this. I, this is a positive thing for us, and we saw some really good things, and I, I want to build off of that rather than focus on the negative because the, the negative stuff we can fix really quickly. Let's get you the Economics Partners valuable stat of today's game brought to you by Economics Partners. Whether for tax, financial reporting, or strategic purposes, when your business needs a valuation, the right partner is Economics Partners. Learn more at econpartners.com. I'm going to go back to a number that we've already shared with our audience and talked with hands uh, about as well, uh, Kalani, but it's the red zone performance. Uh, you've been inside the 26 times in two games, and you have six touchdowns. Th- those are good numbers. So if we can keep doing that, that, then I'll be really happy, but... You know, just let's get in the red zone more, right? And that that's uh, – but I, I like the, that we scored points this week. And, and um, I mean, 14, that flipped the numbers around and got 41. So that's a good sign. I'll take as many points as we can get. We did leave a lot of points on the field still and a lot of big plays on, on all three phases. So uh, we're looking forward to getting that done. Before the break, Greg teased the special team's performance of Marcus McKenzie. I'll add in the blocked punt by Harrison Taggart. There seems to be a lot of big special teams plays in the first two games for you this season. 
Kalani. First, talk about Marcus McKenzie and what type of talent he is, because it feels like he's almost forcing you to put him on the field outside of special teams with his speed. And then talk about special teams altogether. Well, Marcus McKenzie is a big time playmaker, and he—I mean, great genetics. You know, hands we played with his. Oh yeah. With his dad, and know his mom's a track athlete here too, so uh, he's got so much ability, and he happens to have an identical twin that's on a mission right now. So. We're going to get that times two when, when he gets home. Um, but I'm really excited about his playmaking ability, and, and Jay has been trying to find ways to get him on the field. We just happen to have really good corners, experienced corners right now playing. But uh, I think he's he's going to earn more playing time. I mean, that this guy is plays at another level when, once we get to, to the games. And nice seeing him and as a freshman, seeing Harrison Taggart as a freshman making plays. We've got a lot of freshmen making plays out there, which is good for the future. Um, Harrison's going to be a beast, too. He's a, he's a, such a strong and, and, and fast. I mean, these guys are 100-meter guys, too, that are making plays for us. And they're going to – I just really feel like the development has come a lot quicker for them, and um, we're finding ways to get them on the field. Whether, whether it was Marcus with his special teams tackles, uh, Ryan with the punts, Parker Kingston, let's also note, averaged about 30 yards a kickoff return today. So that was happening. The Taggart block you mentioned, I, I'm glad personally that that special teams made a lot of plays on a day when the special teams coordinator couldn't be here. And, and Kelly had to be elsewhere for reasons that are, um, you know, special and and. and, and sweet to him today and heavy on his heart at the same time. You didn't have Kelly today, but you had his team, special teams, playing so well, and I'm glad that plays were made to make uh, make their coordinator proud today. Exactly. And, and you know, Kelly, he, he did an amazing job prepping them this week, and he left for the funeral yesterday, last night. And uh, I know that he um, would love to be here, but, you know, we, we, I think he can feel comfortable knowing that family's always going to be first for us, and we understand that. And, and our... our Condolences and love go out to the Papinga family, Brady and 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 Brooke and family there, and I'm glad that that Kelly was able to be there for his brother. You know that means a lot, and he his guys love him. They play so hard for him, whether they're the DNs or the special teams. And uh, I know he was probably getting really upset at the missed PAT, you know, but <laughs> but uh, everything else worked, worked really smoothly for us. And and special teams has been and uh, has been an X factor for us, and so. It's, and, the first two games and we can we get it's got to be that way every week and um he's done an amazing job i love his leadership i love his passion and he's done a great job obviously we had um he assigned uh jan jorgensen to fill in in his place and jan did an amazing job um you know obviously me and jay are there but this is this is a huge compliment to what kelly's done and then also what jan filling in so kalani just take me into your game plan for your travel and some of the logistics. When do you guys leave for Arkansas? Is this kind of a Lavelle Edwards final year where we went out to Syracuse three weeks early and, <laughs> <laughs> and visited all the church sites? No, this is. Uh, I think we're going to get some barbecue in Arkansas, and that's about it. We're, the, we're the, it's a business trip, and we're going out there. You know, if it's a two, uh, if it's an East Coast time zone, where we're going two time zones. There's only one. Yeah. So we're going to go out Friday. Um, it's a it's a Saturday late afternoon game, right? So I think we're talking to a sports scientist in our travel party. I think we're, we're timing it to the right place where we can get the most out of our guys uh, in the travel. We'll get there and get a, get a quick practice and work out in. Um, but, yeah, I feel really good about the. T- I think we're, we know we're going to have a lot of fans representing there and uh, like they do everywhere we go, you know, so – uh, but we're looking forward to that that matchup. We obviously did not play our best last year, and we're excited to get that, that game again. It's uh, 6.30 Central Time, so 5.30 Mountain Time, body clock time uh, next Saturday. So by the time the game kicks off, it'll be you know dusk, and it'll be it'll be dark by the end of the first quarter. feel like a true night game for you. Yeah, and we're, we do good at some night games, and obviously we did good at some uh, day games. Today was a hot game, and... Working on our tan lines, like I told you before, Greg, you know, get some new tan lines going. But then the, uh, then it got kind of windy and stormy there, and we had to, had to go in. The players had to go in because there might be a lightning um, warning, and uh, I just couldn't help it, man. The fans were all lined up, so I, we called them to come back out of the locker room and run around and hmm. give five to everybody. I just ho- hope the fans know how much we love and appreciate them, and if they're going to stand out there in the lightning uh, 
risk and risk lightning strikes, and we're going to come out and help support them. So I'm glad that the weather worked out in our favor at the end. Well, you had your first uh, back-to-back home game start to the season, too. You hadn't had one of those yet as the head coach, and so it was nice to get a nice foundation under your feet by being here at Lavelle for, for two straight weeks. Now it is time to go uh, earn it on the road with back-to-back away games. Yeah, and that's that's what we got to do, man. I, I'm really thankful for all the fans that were here, the, the, the excitement, the energy that we had. Uh, we need them to keep making noise for us at, at home, and, and now we're going to be able to go see some fans on the road and, and, and see them, and hopefully they can make some noise. And be, they'll definitely be an advantage for us everywhere they go. So, Kruger Nation, you're amazing. We love you, and we're, we're so excited about the support you give us. Uh, Kalani, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this before we let you go because it just popped to me through the last two games. I actually brought it up a couple times with the post-game interviews. Uh, I just love Jay Hill's defensive third down efforts man it's that's the kalani sataki style that i remember that i've grown up in this business with just getting nasty at times bringing the heat and bringing the pressure and being aggressive it feels like the defensive old is that stuff we can expect really moving through the entire season yep speaking my language jay's done a great job uh, i i he the thing is he he called. I thought he called a great game on those third downs. There's a lot of plays that he knows we should have had. That I mean, he was calling it out. We were both looking at it like, oh, this is a pick. It's like, what happened? Oh, it's a sack. The blitz was a little too late. So very fixable things. Get get the eyes guys' eyes in the right spot. Making sure that we're lined up correctly so we can hit the blitz correctly and be in the right spots for the for the bender throws and stuff like that that we know the quarterbacks are going to hit us with. Um, and that's stuff that that. Uh, he and I were talking about immediately after the game. We're like, man, we missed this, this, and this, and it was so nice, man. He, he's speaking my language, and, and I'm, I'm can't, I can't wait for next week. Speaking my language, too. That's right. <laughs> <I'm honest. laughs> Kalani, congratulations again on the, the 2-0 and start, the win today. Uh, you're 2-0 and against Southern Utah, or BYU's 2-0, and uh, and you got both those wins. You faced them in your first year and now in your most recent year, and you have Southern Utah in your history, as do many of you guys. I know there's a lot of respect for both, uh, both between both programs. For sure, and just want to wish the T-Birds all, all you know, best, best of luck the rest of the year. Uh, amazing uh, head coach. He's a class act, just, just a great person, uh, you know, with, with uh, Coach Fitzgerald. And so uh, I thought these guys played extremely hard with tons of effort. And you can't fault them. That's, there's a reason why they played such a close game against ASU. And, and against us, we had some close moments, too. So that's a huge compliment to him and what he's doing down in Cedar City. And, you know, we'll always have support for them, obviously, in the games that we don't play. But, um, man, just, just a really cool to be able to share the field with them and compete with them. Kalani, thank you again. We'll see you next week. See you in Hawk Country. Go Cougs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's Kalani Sitake, and that is the BYU Creamery Cougar postgame coaches show. But let's wrap up the coaches show by hearing from the other coach, and that's uh, Delane Fitzgerald from Southern Utah. He spoke to the media following his team's game here today, a game that BYU wins by a score of 41-16. to We thought BYU special teams were a big factor for the Cougs, and I think Coach Fitzgerald thought they were a factor as well the other way. Here's the coach a short time ago. Special teams I love did us in. Special teams doomed us. We gave up a block punt in the first half. Came out in the second half. We left four points on the board. Missed a, not a chip shot field goal, but a makeable field goal for that young man. And he don't even give us a college level kick there, um, which hurt us. We missed the PAT. And then BYU's got one of the best punters, if not the best punter in the country. And he's hitting them 50 and 60 yards a pop. And he shanks one off the side of his foot for 27 yards and hits our guy in the back of the head. Another turnover. Um, but special teams did us in. Guys, I don't, I don't know if we win, if we play, if we beat them on special teams. I don't know if we win that football game, but we're right there. We're right there with them, even Steven at the end. In the second half, uh, it was only fourteen to thirteen. What adjustments did you guys make to help on that BYU? <laughs> we lost second half by a point. Did, did we really? Our kids like football more. The last two, the last two teams we played, our team, our kids in our locker room like football more than the teams we're playing like football. We're going to come hell or high water. We're going to play for three straight hours. And if it's like last week and it takes six and a half hours, we're going to finish what we start. We're going to play really, really hard start to finish. Justin Miller had his best career game against a Power 5 school. What did you see from him today? Yes, I saw him play the, the way that a 24, 25-year-old should play, the, the way a guy that's playing in the sixth college season should play. Um, I think Justin's best football is still ahead of him. 
Uh, and I appreciate the question. I think it's a good one. I, I think Justin's best football is ahead of him. We're going to see Justin have some big games down the stretch. What do you see in between you and Zach Mitchell this weekend? Zach Mitchell's a good player. We stole one. So stole one out of Boston, guys. Got him to come from Boston to Cedar City. But Zach Mitchell's a good football player. You got a freshman going for 135 today. Good, good football player. This is you, you, good, good question, Spencer. Justin trusts Zach. He trusts him. He knows what the routes are going to be. Knows where he's going to be and when he's going to be there. Any comments on Zach Mitchell putting up a career high performance against Oregon? Just the second game. He'll get a lot of career high performances. So the the young the young man's a real deal. Going to get better going forward. What did you see from your team defensively? Some resolve. Some resolve, which is something we didn't have last fall. Um, that same guys, same week last fall, and, and I, should pre- I should preface it by saying this, that this BYU team is not that Utah team we played last year. That Utah team was four or five plays away from playing in the college football playoffs. This team right here somewhere in the 50s. Uh, they're they're just, just okay. Um, we, we got beat 73-7 to seven this week last year. And if we play well on special teams today, we're in this ball game from start to finish. Any other questions? Coach, any final thoughts on the game? No, guys, thank you all for having me. Thank you all. Class act. All right, that is uh, Southern Utah's head coach, Delane Fitzgerald, uh, head coach of the T-Birds. They fall today by a final score of 41-16. to 16. Well, Hans, you've heard from uh, – Kalani Hisitake, and you've heard from his SUU counterpart. Thoughts after what you've been able to gather from the head coaches tonight? Well, the special teams were really big. I would disagree a little bit with with Coach and just say, I, I even without the special teams' big plays, I think BYU controls this game. I sure would like to see that run game be a little bit more potent. You could hear it in Kalani Sataki's voice. Yep. I think you're going to need it at times because you're going to run across defensive backfields that make it really difficult. But... When they put in an effort to slow down Keaton Slovis, I'm expecting some of those gaps to potentially open in those defenses. So if I'm Arkansas, I'm putting together a defensive game plan where I'm really pressing out on a couple of these BYU wide receivers. I'm probably leaving a couple over the top. I might be taking a linebacker assignment on Isaac Rex and if you run the proper offense and run some of those defenders off, you should have some lanes. Now, the question that you and I have to get into, who takes those carries when those lanes start to open up? Because this game materialized in a little bit different way. I thought that Aiden Robbins would come out and have a little bit better performance. He was put on the sideline, and you saw L.J. Martin take the field pretty quickly, and he took the bulk of the carries today. So I don't know if we've seen the changing of the guard yet, but it sure feels like it's getting close. And L.J. Martin, in the one run that really stands out in my mind, and you might have some that stand up in your mind, there was two broken tackles and a huge effort to get down the right side of the field for a nice gain. That's the one that really stands out to me. Aiden Robbins has yet to have a run that stands out, that pops off the page that says, no, you have to put me on the field. I have to be out there. And he's going to have to take exception to that, get back to practice and make sure that the changing of the guard doesn't happen. I actually think what's happening is a good thing. It's, it's breeding a very healthy competition for those carries. And hopefully that improves both those or all three of those running backs when you throw in Smith as they head to Arkansas. Now, Kent State is not a very good football team. In fact, they're one of the worst projected football teams coming into the season. And uh, Arkansas beat them 28-6 today. Uh, Kent State averaged 0.7 yards per carry. They had 26 yards on 36 carries. Of course, the note there is that 46 yards were lost on sacks of the Kent State quarterback. But So that's uh, of, of, the, of the handoffs. They, attempts, they tried to gain yardage. They had 25 carries for 72 yards, so under three yards a carry when you take away the sacks. In the first game, which uh, came against uh, Western Carolina, Western Carolina ran it for a net of 64 yards on 30 attempts, so a 2.1, and there was some sack yardage in there as well. So uh, either way, Arkansas has faced two teams that you'd expect to handle, and they've taken away the run game from both. They they have, and they're going to go and look at this film and say, all right, so... They like to throw to the outsides, and they're getting some good blocking going against the Southern Utah team. And 
not so much against Sam Houston, but what do we want to do on the outsides? I, If I'm a defensive coordinator, I know I'm scheming for the outside flips more than I'm scheming for their run game. And I'm going to probably leave five in the box, Greg, and until they run on me on five with a safety high that comes in for support, until they can really run on me, well, I'm just going to keep the outsides full. I'm going to keep my protection to the flips and the flats. And if they force me out of it, then they force me out of it. But I think BYU's run game eventually is going to be called on. They're going to have to answer the call because the passing game isn't going to be able to do it solely. So you better get that figured out. So when a defense goes all pass and they really spread it out, you can punish them. You can force them to bring in a big and try to stop that run. You you have to have that balance. He is Hans Olsen, and this has been the BYU Creamery Cougar Post Game Coaches Show. When we come back, we'll have more of Cougar Post Game Live. We'll have trivia for ice cream and uh, your tweets. And if you want to email us, we have a new email address this year. It is Cougar Post Game Live at BYU.edu. If you have thoughts, you simply can't fit into a tweet. That's why I've got the email fired up for you. Cougar Post Game Live at BYU.edu. But you're welcome to tweet us with or without the hashtag, which is hashtag BYUCPL, hashtag BYUCPL for Cougar Post Game Live. You can tweet at me, at Greg Rubel, or use the hashtag BYUCPL. You can drop us an email, Cougar Post Game Live at BYU.edu. Either way, you can join the program and uh, you can spark a discussion. And the discussors will be Hans Olsen. Mitchell Jurgens and me, Greg Grubel, here in the Feast Box broadcast booth. For final score, 41-16. to 16. BYU over Southern Utah. Next week, the grind begins. Ten consecutive power conference games. Never been done before this year, but it'll happen in 2023, and it will all begin in Fayetteville. The Cougs and the Hogs next Saturday. We're back with Cougar Post Game Live, continuing on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Listening to the Cougar Post Game Coaches Show on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now, back to Hans Olsen and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. And we are joined by Mitchell Jurgens in our Feast Box broadcast booth as well. Catching up on the Twitter as I kind of go back through the timeline. And you can, uh, again, tweet at us using at Greg Grubel, that's fine, or hashtag BYUCPL for Cougar Post Game Live. You can also drop us an email using the Cougar Post Game Live at BYU.edu email address. Uh, It's funny, we talked about how the weather got squirrely. And Mitch, uh, maybe a reference from you again from field level on how squirrely and swirly things got out there today. It was it was intense. Um, and it kind of came, I mean, it came pretty quickly, um, but it got swirly. I, I think you had mentioned it. I've never been in a game where there was so much trash debris blowing around on the field and i mean it was windy like i was wearing this lanyard and it got twisted it was almost choked me because you know the thing (laughs) just you know swirls and swirls and um but uh it was it was pretty crazy Uh, but it didn't seem to affect too much of the the play on the field um and uh but yeah conditions got pretty pretty nuts well you just said it brings us to a tweet from kenton and kenton says the debris on the field reminds me of the days back in, 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 in the old games at hawaii where there was trash and that was yeah the Aloha Stadium games that was where the the the, the, the tropical wind would it'd be a warm wind but it would start there would be stuff all over the place at the old Aloha Stadium that's a good memory Ken thanks for bringing that up on the Twitter because yeah things did get a little crazy that way with the debris in Honolulu back in the day for sure Greg Grubel and Hans Olsen with uh, Mitchell Jurgens BYU goes to two and zero they defeat Southern Utah today by a score of forty one to sixteen at CP thirty Blue tweets in with a question uh, Hey Greg he says. Uh, can you explain the covered receiver penalty? And uh, let's uh, have hands address that. We say the receiver was covered. We, well, we use the word coverage a lot, or a receiver's covered by a defensive back, different kind of covered in this case. And the covered in this case has resulted in a penalty that has wiped off a big play two weeks in a row. Hands, take it from there. Yeah, you got to make sure that that receiver is uncovered on the outside before he takes off in route. And when you say covered, it's by your own teammate, meaning there's a teammate to the outside of you that is on the end of the line with you also being on the line. The end receiver is the only eligible receiver. And so if you have a wide receiver, 
receiver on the far side on the line. And let's say you're the slot, but you're also on the line or not where you need to be. You're quote unquote covered up by your own player. Only the edge player is eligible. You are not. And if you touch the pass or catch the pass, not only are you ineligible downfield, it's a loss of down for an illegal touching. Uh, it's a miserable penalty. And it happened, which was a little bit more, it felt more acceptable when it happened with Isaac Rex last week. It was like, okay, tight in, inside. I could understand how you might accidentally cover him up. But when it happened today with a wideout, it was just more unacceptable, and both were on third down, Mitch. Yeah, one quick comment on this. Uh, when Keaton was on the broadcast, he he almost took ownership of it. He's like, I got to get these guys right. This is not Keaton's job. This is the receiver's job. One one player on that line of scrimmage, scrimmage needs to take control. And it, okay, I mean, when you were, when you were playing, I was how, that how did you How did you do it? I, okay. I was that guy. And th- there's always got to be somebody that just recognizes, look, you've got – because it, uh, typically it happens most of the time in, in three wide receiver sets, right? Um, and y- one person just has to step up and control the line of scrimmage. If it gets too complicated, you've got to have – I mean, you may just designate, hey, it's always the outside guy who's on the line. If you're not – if you're one of the inside guys, be off the line um, unless there's a tight end. Like, you, you just – you have to over communicate, and one person has to take control. And I haven't seen a lot of that from these receivers, so I'm I'm curious if that's going to be a takeaway with Fessy and his receivers. One one person has to take take control and and determine, hey, I'm off. And then also, some of the receivers get a little bit too, I, I think, aggressive with being as close to the line as possible, even being or and they think they're off. But in this case, I, I mean, error on the side of be a full yard back, yard and a half. Um, it's not going to make much of a difference in the route tree. Uh, as long as you're getting off on the ball. So uh, I think, I mean, someone's just got to take control down there, and it's and it's on the receivers, So two in my opinion. There, two things. You said when you were part of a, a, a set with multiple receivers, you were the designated take-charge guy, I, make sure. Uh, yeah. And secondly, now there, there's also a component where you see it all the time where a player is checking with the side official, yeah. and he's actually looking to see, what do you think I am? Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They'll point to the, the ref, and the ref will give him a nod or give him a thumbs up. Um, and, and that's typically the guy that's saying, hey, I'm on the line. Everybody else should be off. And if there's confusion, I mean, the ref should say something like, I don't know, there there might be two guys on there. And then you got to look back down the other way, and it's, you know, back somebody up or, or you know, switch spots. I mean, it's but someone has to be the designated guy there to control and if because there's just too many too many scenarios where different people are on the line at times and uh, someone's got to be the voice what is the nature of that penalty why, why do they have that rule in place i've never really understood it's what its yeah. effect is it's i mean it's interesting because and, and there's a lot of trick plays designed off of this rule with the unbalanced formation right they'll pull yes uh, they'll pull a tackle on the other side of the play there's going to be multiple guys covered up up and at times it's by design and it's on the other side of the ball there's someone that, I mean there could be a tackle eligible right because of this rule so you can get pretty cute and and, and creative with it um, but it, I mean it's an interesting rule um, and you know it's, receivers got to be buttoned up on it uh, from Austin Bigelow on the Twitter can hands break down the Southern Utah touchdown over the middle? I think we're talking about the post now with Malik and Jacob defending. What happened or what happened? Was it a breakdown? You remember the play? That was the first touchdown? It was the, that it was, was the first because that one was the one that went over Malik. Yes. Um, On the post. Malik just didn't keep his depth. That receiver got past safety depth. And when that happens and you have a nice, accurate pass, which that was an absolutely beautifully put pass, by Justin Miller, then you got a problem. But Malik did not sense the route and did not drop back to his depth quick enough. What do you see from it, Mitch? Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost like if you're the last man back, you, number one rule is just don't get burnt, don't get beat. And um, I, from from my perspective, it looked like his eyes were in the back. If it was watching the quarterback, you you've I mean, you, you got to have eyes on the receiver. If someone's taken back, just I mean, number one rule, don't get beat. I, I think sometimes at that safety position too when he was about the five maybe he was Malik was maybe the eight yard line when that receiver passed him and I think sometimes as a safety working at depth Greg you think of the back of the end zone you think about the window that that quarterback can drop that ball in and so you try to kind of plan in your mind all right well I'll just split that depth and I'll make sure I use the back of the end zone as an extra defender so I can kind of take a little bit of a risk because this this is underthrown. I get the pick. 
So I don't know how much of that goes through his head, but it was about that distance where you start to expect the back of the end zone to be the defender, and it just wasn't there, especially with the ball that was placed again by Justin Miller. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is Cougar Post Game Live, hashtag BYUCPL if you want to tweet us. And uh, Jason Jordan asks Hans uh, and Mitch to address uh, the BYU pass rush. He says one sack in two weeks. Is, yeah. that, is, is that getting it done? No, that's not getting it done. It's not getting it done. You need more than that, and I've talked about it. Now, the, the quarterback pressures have absolutely increased over these two games from what we've seen in years past. So the pressures have increased that have led to incompletions. The bat of balls have increased. Uh, I, we saw, I think it was Mangelson that had a bat of ball today, and so we've seen some of that increase. But as far as getting to the quarterback and sacking him outside of the Tyler Batty sack in the first half of the Sam Houston game, we have not seen an individual sack. I'm still seeing some pretty good rushes that is creating some pressure, better rushes than I've seen in the past, but not the sacks. Anything in particular from you, Mitch? I mean, I think one of the things is, at least with the SCU offense as well as Sam Houston, these quarterbacks are getting the ball out pretty quickly. Um, there have been a couple, uh, you know, I've been watching a lot of the cornerback blitzes because they've done, they've dialed up a number of those, and there have been a couple where he almost looks like a free lane for that uh, um, that uh, boundary side corner to get to the quarterback but those those quarterbacks are getting the ball out pretty quick so um who knows if if uh you know if if you're uh, going against a a team that's you know going to do a little bit more five steps if if they continue to bring that pressure we may see a little bit more sacks but i agree i mean that that number's got to increase well it's got to increase and so okay so the next step to that question is is it personnel based and Tyler Batty, over the years, he's shown an ability to get the quarterback, but not so much finish at the quarterback. He gets the pressure, and I think that he's working towards it. I expect him to get better at it, but I didn't see Banya get there. Uh, we didn't call Banya's name much today. I would have liked to seen him get a pressure or two. I'd, I would have liked to seen even Caden Hawes or somebody up the middle force a little bit of pressure. So... Yeah, I, I I still have some issue with what we're seeing from the one-on-one rushes. And what Jay Hill is forced to do is manufacture them. On those third downs, he's bringing six. When you bring six, and even if uh, you're keeping six in the block, you're still expected to have at least one of the six pop free on a one-on-one beat. And and that's not happening as much as it should. Uh, and, and, and a lot of times when BYU did bring the six, SUU did have their running back in the block, so they had the six blocker that was picking it up. But still, one in six. That you're giving me a one in six opportunity in a one-on-one to get the pressure and the sack. I expect one of you to win. And, and you know, Mitch, going back to your playing days, the coaches will just scream in your face, I'm rushing six of you. One out of the six of you, please win the one-on-one battle. Go get the quarterback. It just increases your odds to get there when you bring them. This is Cougar Post Game Live, brought to you by Big O Tires. Uh, at Matt Bunker on the Twitter says, uh, Keaton Slovis threading the needle to Rex, and he did that. And his, meaning Slovis' extremely high football IQ, makes me very comfortable with him at quarterback. I want you both to respond to how you've seen Keaton play through two weeks after I tell you that we're going to re- – I just want to restate the eligibility rule just to let people know actually how it stands in the rule book. Um, the offensive team, all players of the offensive team must be either linemen or backs. You're either one or the other. You're a lineman or you're a back. And, and when the ball is snapped – the following Team A players are eligible, and only these Team A players. Each lineman, when I say lineman, a receiver in this case can be a lineman because it's each lineman who is on the end of their line of scrimmage and who's wearing a number other than 50 through 79. So, yes, the wide receiver with a slot receiver inside of him is a lineman in this case. He's eligible. And then each back wearing a number other than 50 through 79. And a back in this case is a slot receiver off the line. So that's... The only people who can catch it, that's what you have to have, and that's just by the rules, just restating what everyone has already known, but how it's actually laid out. Now, as for Keaton Slovis, through two games. First game, a pretty modest uh, passing yardage total. The second game, more what you expect from Keaton Slovis, 348 and four scores with a pick. The pick came under duress, and he now has three rushing touchdowns in two games when he had zero through his entire career to this point. 
on the on the ability to throw the kind of ball he did to Rex and just the kind of quarterback he is relative to quote unquote football IQ. What have you guys seen? Well, Mitch, I want to start with you on that because I he's it, Greg and I were sitting up here watching the speed, the velocity that he puts on some of the balls is is sometimes his velocity too intense. There was one that went through Isaac Rex's hands. I, I said that that should be a ten out of ten catch he, from a guy like Isaac. Yeah, I mean, as a receiver, you own that. And, no matter how fast he's throwing it, you that that's going to be on the receiver. I, I guarantee you that's Isaac Rex saying, dude, don't throw the – he's not saying, Keaton, come on, don't throw the ball so hard. He's like, no, I'm sorry, i got to catch that. Um, I mean, he's, he's humming him, especially when he gets on the run, as we've seen, rolling out to the right. Um, but I will say I, I did see a little bit more finesse today than in week one. It definitely seemed like – I mean, he had a ton of energy coming out playing for the first time at Lavelle under the lights. Um, you could tell he was he was he was pretty juiced. Um, a lot of his misses were overthrows tonight or today. We didn't see as much of that. Um, I saw a calm um, and comfortable and confident quarterback in Keen Slovis today. One thing I really loved what he did is he spread the ball around. I mean, if you go look at the four top receivers, um, these are your your guys on the BYU offense at the skill level position. Every single one of them had a touchdown, and you had four catches from Rex, six catches from Roberts, five catches from Lasseter, three catches from Hill. He spread it around and, and did a good job. I mean, there were um, one thing that we did see this week is um, I liked to see a lot more throws uh, between the numbers. Week one, most of them seemed like they were outside the numbers. Um, just, you know, there, there weren't many plays developing downfield where today there was a lot more of that. Definitely seemed like this is the offense that we want to continue to see moving forward. And Keaton looked comfortable. Um, he looked confident, which which gets me excited for, obviously, the next 10 games that are going to be a little bit more challenging. Well, see, it's, it's fun for me because my, my favorite route that I watch run is the deep skinny post. That's yeah. my favorite route. And... When I see Isaac Rex take off in the slot headed for the skinny post, to me it's like, oh, there it is, there it is, there it is, go get it, and it leads to a touchdown. So I want to see more between the numbers too. I like it. Now I know you risk a little bit, and it can be congested, and that can lead to some problems. I think that Keaton Slovis has enough of an eye. Yeah. The other thing that I was just talking about in regards to Keaton Slovis during the broadcast, Mitch, there was a play where he stepped up in the pocket and the defensive seas parted, and he had at least 15 yards of green. And that was he, Chase Roberts' touchdown, right? Yeah. Uh, I th- Keanu Hill, I think. Was that the – No, that was where he stepped was up Chase and found Roberts. Chase. He stepped up and found was Chase. Oh, that was Chase on the outside. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Okay, so he, he could have ran it, and he stepped right to the line of scrimmage and threw it. I like the fact that he keeps his eyes – downfield he's a pass first type quarterback yeah well in that throw too I mean, we talk about we, we we talked about how talented he is and how much of an army has when he's on the run he was stepping up in the pocket and he was he was on the run it, it, he almost thought that he was going to tuck it and start running because he was moving as I in so. as kind of a, a a sprint forward and then just unleashed it but yes yeah, so, uh, i definitely agree with that he, he's definitely you can see him as a veteran quarterback out there he's building um, some some chemistry with those receivers, and it was great to see. Um, uh, it, it was great to see you know receivers come back today and and the experience there. So I, I think they're just uh, they're gelling at the right time, and and they they got the they got the right feeling back heading into next week at Arkansas. Keanu was at 14 yards a catch. Uh, Chase was at 14 yards a catch. Lasser was 15 yards a catch. Isaac Rex was 28 yards a catch on four for a buck 12. So BYU's pass game was uh, a lot more uh, in terms of pass per completion and attempt looking more like itself today. Before we uh, hit the break, a few more hits on Twitter. Uh, Sas- uh, Sasquatch Cougar is his name on Twitter, and he says he brought his boys down from Weezer, Idaho for the game. Who comes down from Weezer, Idaho to BYU? Uh, had a good time, he says, and it was his three-year-old's first time at a BYU game. We turned to Weezer's own Hans Olsen for a comment. <laughs> Did you bring your fiddle with you? <laughs> Your, oh, your clogs in your fiddle? <laughs> no, I only mention that because you do. I would not. Oh, do that. no. You, hey, you hit it, man. That's what we do in Weezer. We clog and we fiddle, man. We got the fiddle festival, and I was part of the Kick Up Kids for three years. I was a clogger, and uh, it, and that's what we do there. So I'm glad you came down for the game, 
And we appreciate you. Safe travels wherever you head from here. All right. Uh, three comments coming in, so I'm going to kind of um, I'm gonna, uh, amalgamate them into one comment about the run game. Uh, so question one says, what can BYU do to get the run game going? 50 yards doesn't give me a lot of encouragement with the schedule toughening up that from Joseph. Uh, and then the next question, uh, Brian, how concerned are you about the run game? I don't feel that BYU quite knows who they want to turn to yet as a running back and thought they'd get it going against Southern Utah. And then Jarrett says, seems like run has been a lot more east-west, not enough north-south. So seeing all those three comments together, yeah. maybe your response to that. Okay, so I've actually got a theory on this because there comes a time as an offensive staff that you have to just see the obvious that's in your face. The obvious in your face answer is L.J. Martin has been the better option at running back. So stop trying to force a square peg in a round hole and just call it what it is and say, all right, he's the better running back. Give him the starting reps and let him go. If that's, if that's how you see it, because that, that's the high view that we've got, L.J. Martin seems to be the better back. Now make the call and give him the starting reps. That can improve in and of itself because he's getting the, the bulk of the reps, he's getting the starting reps, and that gives him the confidence. Oh, okay, well, I don't have to wait two series to get in and get these plays. Plus that will help him in his pass pro too because you want to see that improve. So first and foremost is make the decision and then ride, ride the horse. And I think L.J. Martin is that horse. Number two, go look at some of your blocking schemes in the run game. Are you a little bit too zone heavy in your block schemes in the run heavy, in the run game? Can you go to some man schemes? You know, because what I saw in the Sam Houston game in film review, and the only way to really get an understanding of blocking schemes and run game improvement is film review. You can't do it off a one-off from a booth. So I'll go back and I'll look at this game. But I can tell you from Sam Houston, they were having problems with their zone blocking schemes, especially on the backsides of their counters. On the backsides of counters, you've got to wall off the backside D tackle. That backside D tackle made two or three plays in the run game because you weren't walling him off. He was just scooping over the wall. And when you're pulling your guard and your tackle from the opposite side, okay, so now I've got the in-man line of scrimmage accounted for because the guard's going to kick him out. And I've got play side linebacker accounted for because the tackle pulls up and gets him. What I don't have an accountment for is a backside D tackle that comes over or hump blocks over the the, the center, and it's standing right there in the hole. Mm. That's a zone issue. So if I'm the center, I have to be able to wall that off. That was a problem against Sam Houston. And, and, it's, and it's not just in that counter poles that was the issue. I'm seeing that in other uh, areas of the run game, that it might be the backside D tackle or backside DN that nobody is walling off in their zone, and he's coming over and making the play. The other thing is defensive specifics. They're scheming against the run game, so you just got to keep softening them up. Arkansas has to focus on the pass. Slovis just said, hey, look, everybody, I'm arrived. I'm here. I might be the freshman Slovis that everybody thought I might be. So Arkansas better pay attention to that, and there should be some opportunity. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit nervous. Make a big boy decision. Get the better running back going. If it is L.J. Martin, which it appears to be, give him the starting reps and just improve some of the zones. And maybe go to a man scheme if you got to go to a man scheme. Mitch, anything there? I, I think the only, the only question for me is, after these first two weeks, um, BYU's had the pretty significant size advantage. Just pure physicality. I want to see this team continue to rise and improve where regardless of the schemes that are being called, like, look, I'm bigger than you. I'm going to move you down the field, and, and let's get downhill. So uh, I think that's going to be the biggest thing to watch because obviously as we get into the next 10 games, there's going to be an increase in size of these opponent, uh, opposing D lines. Um, and so that, that's, that's the question. I hope they can fix that and really just bring the physicality because I, I like what I see across the other position groups from a physicality standpoint. We're seeing it with the downfield blocking, with the receivers, uh, the tight ends. Um, and even in the, in the secondary, we're seeing a lot of you know, downhill physical um, tackles that, that, looks, that looks really good. We're seeing some defensive swarms. Um, but I think at the line of scrimmage, there can be an uptick in just physicality, toughness. Um, and I'm bigger than you. I'm going to move you um, because I can, right? So I want to go back to a play that was down in – the north end zone, Mitch, and I'm sure you saw it. You saw the flag come out. It was on Caleb Etienne. 
it was a holding penalty on Salmasu uh, Siosi. And that's the type of run blocking that has to improve. If we're going to talk about a man-style run blocking and you've just got an outside backer or you've got a DN that you've got to get out there, scoop on, and block, that has to improve. He didn't take the right steps. He took the wrong angle. Linebacker got the edge. Instead of being able to drive him out of bounds or drive him down the field, he had to hold on to the jersey just to try to prevent a TFL. And obviously it led to a yellow flag coming out with a holding call. So you can improve in those areas. I I would like to see individual offensive run blocking improve as well. I I did see some things I like, and I always want to throw that in because – People focus so hard on the negatives, they forget to look at some of the positives. And I I know that there was a former offensive lineman that went really hard at the offensive line last week. And to a certain degree, rightfully so. But there's always individual performances that need to be highlighted. There were guys that were run blocking and deserve praise, and it's not all bad. But I need to see that right tackle. In that play, he's got to improve. Because if number 50, who plays at the FCS level, is out there making that play down by the goal line, if the game's on the line and you've got to make that tackle or that block to get to the outside and you end up holding against Arkansas, it's going to go from, hey, that's a cute little thing that needs to improve to, Holy cow, how did that not improve? How did you just get a holding call in that block setting? And then I have to get a little bit more upset. And I, I don't I don't want to be upset. You don't like you wouldn't like hands when he's angry. I just want to eat barbecue. I, I don't <laughs> I don't want to be upset. Big O Tires Cougar Post Game Live. We have the Twitter, hashtag BYUCPL. You can just go at Greg Grubel as well. Plus we have the email address, the new one, Cougar Post Game Live at BYU.edu. William has emailed him. We'll hit one email before the break, and he says Greg and others. Um he, uh, the thing, he, he liked the broadcast. We'll thank you for that. And then he says, question one, uh, when you have the all-out rush and the quarterback still runs up the middle, uh, is someone assigned to watch for that one particular play? That's question one. Question two, he said he's also interested in Hans' grading of the D lineman today. Yeah. no, as, as individuals, you could be on that. But no, yeah. there isn't. Now, with K.J. Jefferson, yes, there will be. They should assign a spy. So you might have a safety spy. You might have a middle linebacker spy. But – K.J. Jefferson, you're a little bit more aware. Against Southern Utah, against Sam Houston, whether it's Shoemaker or Miller or whoever, it's not as big in that moment. Typically, when it's third and 12, you're just thinking to yourself, all right, so he escapes the pocket and he goes and gets nine. Well, now we've got him at fourth and two, fourth and three. They still have to punt, and that's that's a win. So... You don't typically have a quarterback, uh, some type of quarterback assignment or spy assignment. It's typically a safety or a corner that's got to break off of their coverage responsibilities and, and converge. And more importantly, it's on the defensive line to sustain a very disciplined pass rush, which then takes me to the second. Yeah, segues as to how the D-line performed today. By the way, uh, the leading stat man on the D-line today was Mangelson, uh, four tackles, two solos. So defensive line against Arkansas, you you probably aren't going to see many sacks in that game because you have to run a, dis, a very disciplined pass rush lane. So I cannot get pushed wide. I can't really show full aggression because if I get full aggression and I get bumped wide, then K.J. Jefferson's gone. And last year, uh, K.J. Jefferson was not sacked. Jaron Hall was not sacked. Neither team had a sack. Two really good running quarterbacks last year. And how many rushing yards did K.J. Jefferson have? K.J. Jefferson ended up on the day with 32 on 10 carries. So 3.2. His long scamper was 14. So I look at a guy like K.J. Jefferson, and I just – of game plan defensive line play against so many rushing quarterbacks. And when you have that quarterback, it's all lane style. It was lane style when, if I'm putting together a defensive game plan for Zach Wilson or Jaron Hall, I'm rushing lanes. I am rushing lanes. I am not free rushing. Even on a third and eight, a third and 10, maybe even a third and 12, I'm still not getting overly aggressive and thinking that I can just go anywhere with my pass rush. I know my pass rush is in about a two-yard setting, and I know that it's on a train track. And, I, and I've got to stay there because if I get out of there, K.J. Jefferson will, will run right to where I vacated, and that's a problem. So don't let that happen. Um, it's going to be disciplined pass rushing lanes against K.J. And if you're going to get there, it's probably going to be manufactured. 
through different blitzes and stunts. We did not see a corner blitz today, did we? Uh, I thought I Eddie came. I thought Eddie yeah. came. I thought Eddie for one for, that I remember, but there were there were a couple. There were a couple. I know Cam, I know Camden came on one. Okay, running back picked it up. Yeah. Well, th- well, there you go. And Eddie may have, he, and, and now Eddie may have been quote unquote playing inside. He might have been nickel. He might have been coming from nickel at that point. Right. But still. Either way. Still. Uh, let's hit a break. Uh, let's do this. Let's uh, let's get the trivia question out there. Uh, the correct answer and the first correct answer on my timeline. We have to say so. This is going to go. Uh, to at Greg Rubel with the hashtag uh, BYUCPL. Really, the first one with the hashtag BYUCPL, as long as it has the correct answer. First one in gets the uh, two half gallons of famous BYU Creamery ice cream. It's, it's Inside Scoop Trivia, brought, brought to you by the BYU Creamery, the classic BYU tradition. Have a scoop today. A lot of talk about uh, tight end records with uh, Isaac Rex uh, get, catching his 22nd career touchdown pass today, tying Gordon Hudson. For the record, almost had the record to himself, but he was caught five yards shy of the end zone after going for 65 downfield. So a lot of talk about tight end numbers with uh, Isaac going over 1,000 yards and getting his 22nd touchdown catch today. Here's the question. Who's the single season receiving yardage leader for a BYU tight end? Who is BYU's single season Receiving yardage leader all time. That's the question. First correct answer with hashtag BYUCPL wins two half gallons of famous creamery ice cream. This is BYU Creamery. Uh, rather, we had the BYU Creamery Cougar Post Game Coaches Show. This is Cougar Post Game Live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Let's rejoin Greg Rubel and Hans Olsen for more Cougar Post Game Live on the new skid, BYU Sports Network. And Mitchell Jurgens, hashtag BYU CPL, BYU 41, Southern Utah 16, our final score. It is Big O Tires Cougar Post Game Live. We've given you the trivia question for two half gallons of famous BYU Creamery ice cream, and it revolves around the tight end position. The question was who holds BYU's single season tight end receiving yardage record? Now, for a career, the record's held by for a career, the record's held by Dennis Pitta. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not him, but the first guess is that I get all they're like really Pitta heavy. I got a Dennis Pitta, I got a Dennis Pitta, I got a Dennis Pitta, I got a Gordon Hudson. I got a Todd Christensen. I get a Dennis Pitta, I get a Pitta, I get a Pitta, I get a Harleen. and I'm scrolling and I'm scrolling until I get the first correct answer, and it has come in. Who do you think it might be, guys? Bushman? Nope. No. Mealy? Ty Detmer's guy. Lewis? Ty Detmer's guy. Chris Smith? Smith? Oh, Chris my Smith. Gosh, I should. 1990, catching balls from Ty Detmer, 1,156 yards. Todd Christopherson is the winner of two famous, uh, two, uh, famous half gallons of, of creamery ice cream. And so I'll be getting info from, uh, from Todd uh, through the DMs on the Twitter, and we'll get the ice cream to him, which reminds me, I forgot to get a hold of last week's winner. How lame is that? I'm sorry. <laughs> just, it just hit me now that among my items on the, on the to-do list, I, I forgot that one. So whoever it was, and I do remember who you were, I'll find you. It's coming. It's you know, com- it's you know he's sitting in a dark room somewhere circling your name like, I'll get that. <laughs> I'm going to get right on this one. So, uh, and, and I am kind of the guy. I'm like, I'm like the point of contact on this stuff. You think somebody would be in charge of yeah. it? Well, I'm in charge of it. Come on, let's put juice in. I'm in charge of making this happen. So, yes, Todd's correct. It's Chris Smith. So, Chris Smith has the single season yardage leader. Pitta has the career tight end receiving yardage leader. Uh, in terms of receptions for a career, it's Pitta. Uh, touchdowns for a career, it's now Gordon Hudson and uh, Isaac Rex. And Isaac can uh, break the record with his next touchdown. He was so good today. That's just what I expected in game one, but he was so good today, so much more fluid in timing, in route, and he was better in his blocking, too. He's the one that sprung, I think it was the Lassiter off the left side, that big run up the sideline. He sprung that run with a beautiful block on the outside. Yeah, I think you called this. Didn't you say last week that Isaac was going to be the guy this next week? They had got to figure out how to get him involved, and... They did, I did that. I did. I in fact I went on with the uh with with the uh sports network guys and and had a blast and I they said, "Well, who's the comeback guy of the week?" and I said, "It's it's Isaac Rex. It's got to be. He had to do better than he did the week before because I know what type of piece he is for this offense. This offense has to use him all year long. Can't go away from him. 
Yeah. Well, and they used him the way that you wanted him to be used. Yes, exactly. He's over the middle. I wanted more more yeah. interior routes and, and more blocking opportunities. But, yeah. Greg, you go back to that Max Hall-Dennis Pitta connection. You remember defenses were scheming out of their minds to try to take Dennis Pitta out. And they were drawing up dig routes where Pitta would dig between the two defenders that were trying to bracket him, and Max Hall would just dish it down low and, and put it into a slot where – Dennis Pitta was still getting his receptions and his yardage, even though everybody was focusing on him. That's the type of guy Isaac Rex is. So make sure you put some heavyweight on him. And even when they start to scheme for him, use different routes to take advantage of what the defense is doing and still find him. You talk about how they were scheming back in the day, and not only was it Max Hall to Dennis Pitta, but then, oh, you also had Austin Colley and Harvey Unga that you were trying to scheme. That, that was such a loaded tight end, wide receiver, running back, quarterback, quarterback situation. Like it was four of the best guys ever to play the position all in the same offense at the same time. That's incredible. That was a good time. That was that was uh, that was the BYU fan days that I was watching too. So I've got some fond memories watching those four. No, that collection of, and those guys were more often than not healthy and available together and always producing. And it was a true pick your poison offense. The other thing about those four guys is they were as full of vinegar as you can find in football players. They might come across Dennis might come across as a nice guy, but I used to watch him at practice and. Boy, was that guy a competitor. Man, to the bone, he and Max Hall and Austin Colley and and Harvey Unga, there there was not a nice bone in their body when that ball would kick. They were. And that's when you were seeing BYU roll up one and two and three double-digit win seasons in a row. That was an epic time, that 27 to 2010 era of BYU football. All right, so uh, congratulations to Todd Christofferson. The correct answer to our question tonight was uh, was Chris Smith. Chris Smith, you know, when, when I pulled in today, this morning, it was around 1030, sun was shining, I didn't see a cloud in the sky. You ever, on a sunny day, you crack your windows just to keep the airflow in your vehicle so that when you get back, it's not... Oh, no. <laughs> I, might have, I might have done that this morning. Oh, no. The weather now is not what it was then. I did not see this coming. You, uh, you bake! <laughs> How did you not let me know? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, between between the uh, the cyclone winds earlier and the rain now, I think I'm going to be uh, I'll be I'll, I'll be in for something in the interior of my vehicle tonight. Greg's on his way to quick quack. <laughs> exactly. Uh, interior vacuum. Uh, question from hands coming in from Brad Gold on the Twitter hashtag BYUCPL. Uh, you kind of hit the D line already. How did you feel that both lines did today? Generally speaking, people love your trench expertise. Well, I. Would grade the offensive line somewhere in that B to to B plus range, and I would grade that defensive line somewhere in that C plus to B minus range. You know, I I got enough out of the D line that it forced Southern Utah into a couple bad situations. I got enough out of the offensive line that there were no sacks, decent protection. I just want to see more movement in the run game. I. I still believe in Caleb Etienne, and I, I believe that he can get things moving. But he's got to get a little bit more effective on play side run blocking. So when the run is coming to his side, I just want to see him get a little bit more effective and being able to move guys. The guy is six foot eight, three hundred and sixty pounds. He should be able to lift a six foot four, two hundred and sixty five pound defensive end and get him moving. And I, so I want to see a little bit more of that. And that doesn't take away from some of the good blocks that he's had, but do better. Um, and, I, and I think he can get better. But so it's not – those aren't the best grades, obviously. Those aren't the best grades. Uh, and that is a one-off view, and I want to be careful with that. But there is a lot of room to improve one-on-one with that defensive line. I did see Caden Oz with a couple of really nice plays on the D-line. Uh, Caden ended up with, uh, I think he ended up with some decent numbers today out of his spot. Uh, Caden was uh, three tackles, two solo, one uh, TFL. Good for him. And then I thought Blake Mangelson had another good game. You mean the Mangler? The Mangler. He had a good game. I, I don't know. Did they have him out playing corner? Because I did see one tackle on a receiver like 20 yards deep. <laughs> I don't know if they were playing the Mangler at the corner position or what, but he's chasing dudes down, chasing down a receiver, getting a backside tackle. Uh, Mitch, anything from you on that? No. Okay. Uh, let's do this. I think we're about to wrap things up. Uh, one question, and this will be not from uh, not from the internets, but from uh, from me. 
wins are hard to come by, and you never take any uh, win for granted. And uh, and and yet you know that you began with a first-year FBS team and an FCS team for your first two games. And BYU played varying degrees of good in each week. Now, they all know that it gets real next week in Fayetteville, and it stays real all year. As you go, Arkansas followed by nine straight Big 12 games. How much do you expect, or how much might there be, a, a raised level of, of competition and or execution or productivity simply by the fact that human nature says the game next week was not the game today? Uh, or is that too much to ask? I mean, I think I think naturally it's going to happen with these players. Um, uh, w- what we saw from week one to week two, which I, I still expect another jump into week three and on, is the creativity in both the offense and defensive play calling. Um, I think that's going to bring a level of, hey, this is now we're ready to go. We haven't shown everything. There may be some things that they're dialing up that they just didn't want to display week one and two, knowing that we're going to come away with some wins. Um, and uh, and they did just that, going 2-0. and This is what you want. I'm, I'm a big fan of this setup. Uh, I never got to play in that. It was week one, and was, <laughs> those were your biggest games, week yeah. one, week two, week three, week four. And oh, uh, Mitch, if I could just, yeah. uh, I want you to finish your point. Don't lose your spot. But this is literally, this is not, this is no joke. This is 99th year of football. This is the first time that BYU's ever opened with two games that included neither a P5 nor back-to-back FBS opponents. So an FBS, FBS, an FBS, FCS start with the FBS team not being a P5. That's never happened before. This has never happened where they've given themselves this, this kind of runway into the season. So it's, un- it's very unusual. I, I mean, I, I love it. And one of the things I think that I've noticed just being down on the sidelines is um, over the first couple of weeks, I'm, I'm probably coming in many, many times with injury reports. We haven't had a lot of those on-field injuries. Um, and, and, you know, do you attribute that to the, the level of competition? They're, they're not... I don't know, you know, being a little bit protective of these players uh, as the as the season gets started, um, which which has been positive. Yeah, there was a little hiccup there with Kingsley today. Hopefully, he's he's good to go. It seems like he is because he, he seemed in, to say that he would. Be he, fine. he kept coming back back into the game. Had some preseason injuries, but as far as injuries on the field, these first two games, it's been they, they've been escaped pretty healthy, uh, which is which is positive. You go now into the thick of your schedule, two and zero. Oh, with a pretty healthy team from the start of the season, uh, which is which is encouraging. So, from my point of view, Greg, I if I can, and I know that there's going to be some scheduling issues as as BYU might lose an opponent or two and have to reschedule a couple things. Um, I am going to use this as some type of blueprint format moving forward because. 11 transfers come in and give you starting minutes to have these two games to unify them, to test them, to teach them, and have those opportunities before you go on the road in a difficult environment. It's so valuable when you're implementing that much unique and new talent. So I would use it as often as I could. I, I would use this as the format moving forward for my preseason scheduling. Thank you, Hans. This is my 32nd year on the BYU football radio broadcast crew. The first nine were on sidelines. The last 23 is play-by-play. And over those 32 years, we've made a few forays BYU has into SEC territory. And that's both sidelines and play-by-play. Uh, playing in Tuscaloosa going to Oxford in the Grove and playing Mississippi State multiple times, going to Tennessee in the checkerboard. Uh, these are special days. SEC football is a special spe- – and, you know, people make fun of it. It just means more. No, it means more. SEC football to those people and nationally, it, it earns the title. It earns the moniker and the mantra. And any time you get to go into SEC country to play a game, it's a special day and a special experience. And now we get one. Arkansas next Saturday night. Did you play some, Mitch? Yes. Um, <clears throat> we had Mississippi stay here. Um, I don't. It was a home and home. I know we went back. It was a home and home. Yep, yep. Um, I'm trying to think uh, who I played. Oh, we played uh, We played Missouri, but it was in Kansas City. Kansas City. Yep. That was a cool arena, but it wasn't in, in uh, SEC Stadium. Those, I remember those two. 
Who else? We got to play in Tuscaloosa. We played Alabama. That was the game I'm talking okay. about. That was a Sean Alexander running back game. That was late. In the, that was the late. That was a pickle juice game. That was a cramping game. That was a cramping. That was when pickle juice became pretty famous. That was a cramping game, and I think that that was the year that I that I first grabbed the defensive tackle start. So that was I think my second or third game of my sophomore year or fourth game. Third, third. It was ninety eight, so it would have been your sophomore year. Sophomore year, yeah. And, and they now, yeah. So that that was Alabama. There, that's Brian Denny Stadium. That's as good as it gets. That's well, it was. It's incredible. And if I remember right, Greg, and you probably remember better, I felt like there was one road in, and it was about a six mile stretch of traffic that they split off. So they're all in the gravel, and the traveling team comes down this split lane, and all the cars pull off, and they get out of their cars and. They're giving you all kinds of crazy greetings, and they try to make it a six-mile stretch of anger and vinegar and what's about to come. And it was unique. It was really unique. It's one that really sticks out in my mind. We actually competed in that game. We we were yeah, okay yeah. in that game. Uh, we opened up with um, – I oh, don't know. I was thinking back. We did have Mississippi State once back in my time. I think we had them here in this stadium. Well, it, uh, Mississippi State was in your last year, the Lavelle year. Uh, beat them, he, uh, lost to them here. Okay. And then in Gray, Gray Croton's first year, the next year, we went back down to Starkville and won that game. Yeah, that's right. I so was... Mississippi State and Ole Miss and Alabama and Tennessee and Arkansas and LSU have been the L, the, the SEC te- teams BYU's played. Now the LSU game was in was in New Orleans and Superdome. It wasn't in in in, in Death Valley. It wasn't in, in an SEC venue. But when you get into those venues, you get to experience everything Hans just talked about. And yet there's also this flip side of Southern hospitality that is a, that is a real thing. Yeah, they want to kill you, and yeah, they're pretty uh, vociferous and they're intense. But there's also a, a feeling like we're all football fans here. You know, your you're, you're people visiting and our people here, we're all football fans. We love the game. We love our football. And you feel it. My when, wife. You, when you go to the barbecue joints and you hit the places, you feel like they're happy to have you and show you what it's all about. Yeah, my wife continues to talk about <clears throat> the experience she had in Knoxville. That was when we were on the broadcast, and the, obviously that was a fun, fun win, fun atmosphere. But um, you know, I've got my my daughter; she's wearing her BYU cheer outfit in in royal blue, and and the way that those fans treated. Um, my wife and, and daughter was just remarkable. She still talks about it to this day, it. and and it's great. I mean, you you find that all over SEC country, which is just uh, it, it's it's a fun atmosphere. Oh, well, okay, going back to the Max Hall era, they also took on an SEC opponent in Texas, in Oklahoma. Yeah, wow. God, yeah. <laughs> let's let's give it let's give him one more year before we can say I, that. I don't even want to. Yeah, get out of here. Go on. So BYU has a good record against SET when you include Texas and Oklahoma. It gets yes. really good. Then it gets, it gets a really... lot better. Go on. We don't watch anyway. Oh, get out of here. Yeah. All right. So yes, uh, SEC teams on the uh, on the agenda today or this year in Big Twelve country as well. Okay, uh, let's wrap it up. Let's call it good for today. Uh, BYU is a winner, forty-one to sixteen over Southern Utah to go to two and zero on the year. 18 and 0 against FCS opponents all time. You look to win these games and win them a certain way, and for the most part, BYU did. A few things to clean up, but uh, you know, do it in time for Fayetteville and see what turns out again. I think that uh, Arkansas beat Kent State, but didn't destroy Kent State. 28-7. Yeah, this is a winnable you know, game. And 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 I, I, I talk about with game. Kalani the Raheem Sanders thing. It's that's news. Yeah, uh, Rocket Sanders. And they call him Rocket for a reason. He put a, he put 175 on BYU last year. Okay, he was a difference maker. Oh, it's a wonderful, it's, it's so so win. he's out. He didn't run today, and they said Coach Pittman said it's a week or two with him. If it's a two week injury and you don't see him next week in Fayetteville, it's a factor. He he was unstoppable last year and didn't play today. They were good. They were not great. They were good. Good enough to beat Kent State twenty eight seven on a touchdown in the first, second, third, and fourth quarters. So no Raheem Sanders. We shall see. But KJ Jefferson by himself. Uh, can do a lot. A.J. Green was good today. Dubinian was good today. There's enough guys. There's no doubt. they got to play great football next week, BYU does, to be in the game. Hey, speaking of SEC country, Texas right now up 13-3 over Alabama. So there you go. That's a Big 12 opponent in SEC country, and right now they've got a 10-point lead. Baylor was up 13-3 on Utah. How'd that turn out today? Ooh. <laughs> yeah, that uh, finished well for Utah. It did. They, are, they like BYU, are 2-0 to begin the year. Two nice wins. Uh, two P5 wins, Florida and Baylor. And the Baylor Bears, Dave Aranda and his Bears are 0-2. A loss to Texas State at home, and then Utah was going to be a tough get-well game, no doubt, but certainly leading 13-3. They had to figure they had some things figured out and did not go their way. And the Bears are 0-2. 
well, to start the year. You know Jeff Grimes. It's I'm sure he's not taking that well. Oh, well, there's 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 a lot of people that uh, are feeling a little heat right now down in down in Waco for the way the season has started. But hey, the great thing is. The great thing is every Saturday now we can look around a league and check standings oh, and check so results fun. and care about it and know, so know that it all means something. Like last night, I'm mowing the lawn. I couldn't do it today because, of course, we're here all day. It was a, a, and we had, I was here early, so I'm mowing the lawn last night, and I was listening to Brian Haney and, uh, and Kansas. Well, I listened to the Kansas game, the Kansas-Illinois game, on the radio as I, as I mow the lawn. And I'm thinking, I, I want to be doing this. This is a Big 12 team. I want to hear what's going on. And I, I just got, I got pumped for the weekend listening, listening to Brian's call last night uh, of the KU Illinois game. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, he does a great job. And there's so many good. Bro- well, Hans, we were at the Big 12 media days, and we went to the Big 12 broadcaster dinner. Yeah. All those play-by-play and color guys together, and man, they just made us feel right at home. And you got to talk with so many great dudes that are really good at their craft and. It was just a cool feeling to be in that group and 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 have them you know share their wisdom and welcome us in and, and be part of a, a brotherhood. Oh, they're excited to have BYU. I've talked to a lot of them post, and I, I'm sure you have too. And I stay in touch with them. I've had five or six of them on my show just in conversations about their teams and what's going on. And man, they're they're thrilled to have BYU to be in this conference. Mm-hmm. And, you know, pre pre uh, Pac-12 movement. BYU was such a great addition for them. They were all excited, and they can't wait. And uh, until BYU shows that they belong and they might own that conference, and then maybe they won't be so hospitable. Well, hopefully that's the outcome yeah. in a few years here. But uh, BYU's maybe we won't gonna... get invited next time. <laughs> we're in. That's the we're goal. BYU is going to get its feet wet this year, and they'll get their feet wet in Fayetteville next week. So excited to be heading out to Arkansas. It'll be BYU in Arkansas with a 5.30 Mountain Time kick, making it a 3.30 Mountain Time pregame on the BYU Sports Network. The Cougars and the Razorbacks. Cougars look to get one back after what happened here in Provo last year. That was a heck of a game. People go, oh, Arkansas was unstoppable. Now they won 52-35, to but uh, this was a 38-35 game late in the third quarter. This was a one field goal, three-point game before uh, Arkansas got a couple of touchdowns late to, to make the score look a little uh, less appetizing. But this was a back-and-forth shootout, and BYU was right there. I think a late turno- or late third quarter turnover kind of turned the tide. It was a possession that BYU didn't finish. Arkansas scored on it. They end up winning 52-35. But that was a shootout that BYU was in. This year's defense should be better, and we'll see if the offense can also be a little bit better as they improve from week one to week two, maybe week two to week three as well. You know who I want to see just get rowdy against Arkansas? I want to see those two Weber State corners get rowdy. Those two can Cam play. Yes, they can play a real role. And they bring that Jay Hill intensity. I've seen it. You, you've seen it. Now you've got to pick from each of them, right, in the first yep. two games. Yep. Uh, yeah. Each of them have at least one. And you're seeing some really good stops on the edge, defeating blocks and getting big stops. I want to see that outside aggression continue. And then, you know, I don't know where Talon Alfrey stands with, with his situation. I'd love to see Talon Alfrey. Feels like it's not close yet for him. Does it? That feels like it's that, me. That, that's a bummer because I'd, I'd have loved to have seen him out there. But um, I love those outside corners and the aggression they bring. Okay, but we're setting it up for next Saturday. Uh, Before we go tonight, uh, good luck to Jennifer Rockwood's BYU women's soccer team. The number one team in the country is playing up the road at Utah tonight. BYU and Utah soccer at 7. Good luck to Jen and the crew there. And uh, they'll play TCU Thursday night here at home on ESPNU in their first ever Big 12 game. And then they'll be on the road for Big 12 competition in the week following as well. So big week week and uh, weekend for soccer coming up. Good luck to Jen and the team in Salt Lake City tonight. Let's conclude our broadcast by thanking our crew back at BYU Radio. Our coordinating producer is Terry South. Our control board operator is Seth Larson. Thanks to the engineering staff over at the BYU Radio shop. And to our engineers here in the booth, we had Clark Jackman, and we had Michael Wimmer, and we have Scott Sandstrom. We had uh, statistical help from Ralph Sokolowski and the interns, Talmadge Hilton and Jerem Hartzell and Juice Woodson joining us here in the booth. Juice was with us uh, all day long here. And uh, Hands and Juice have become buddies. Yeah, he's my guy. He's my guy. I'm, uh, he, he, uh, he's been Johnny on the spot for us all day. <laughs> okay. And to our spotter, uh, McKay Perry, appreciation, our pregame Cougar Canyon scoreboard and in-studio scoreboard host, Jason Shepard. To our Cougar Canyon engineers, Barry Squires 
and Sean O'Neill. Who else am I forgetting? Anybody that uh, comes to mind? I hit them all. Think I hit them all? Scott thinks I hit them all. Clark, hit Clark here. Uh, Clark got the uh, post-game comments from Coach uh, Fitzgerald. Thanks to uh, Clark for hey, doing that. Uh, if I could. Yeah, you could. You got a heck of a crew. These are great people. Good people, aren't they? Yeah, from Mike to Clark. That's a big crew. There's Rob, a lot of people okay. that help us make uh, make us sound good, ideally. It, yeah, It is one of the finest crews. You could go to Barry and what he does to get you on air. It is, I've been around a lot of different broadcast crews. This crew is special. And, of course, being with you and Mitch, it's just uh, it's a dream come true. Well, it's been a fantastic start to, to this new era with uh, Hans in the booth. And Hans has been right at home. And every listener that I hear from... They're not surprised. They're just so happy and pleased and impressed by what by, by what uh, Hans does. And Mitch has been Mitch for so long now. He's just uh, steady Eddie down there on the field. And uh, I'm just blessed to work with both you guys and the entire crew we just mentioned. So for all those folks, heavy, uh, hearty thanks into the BYU Athletic Communications crew with uh, Brett Pine and Kenny Cox and Duff Tittle and uh, Tyson Jex and so many others headed by John McBride. Appreciation there. And once I start, I'll never stop if I start naming people. But thanks to all those folks. And so for my partners to my right, Mitchell Jurgens, and to my left, Hans Olson. My name is Greg Rubel. Thanking you once again for tuning in. Our final score today is BYU 41, Southern Utah 16. So in the meantime and in between time, this has been BYU football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Good night and so long from Provo, Utah. You have been listening to live coverage of BYU football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Coverage of today's game has been brought to you by All Pro Capital Real Estate Investments. By Les Olson IT, your office technology partner. BYU football is also brought to you by Smith's Food and Drug, fresh for everyone. BYU football is a production of BYU Athletics in association with BYU Broadcasting. Special thanks to BYU President Shane Reese, Vice President Keith Vorkink, Athletic Director Tom Homo, and Associate Athletic Director of Corporate Sponsorships Casey Stauffer. BYU football is an exclusive presentation of the new skin, BYU Sports Network.